This podcast is brought to you by Helix Sleep. Night after night, two people lay in the same bed, but when it comes to buying a new mattress, only one gets their way. That is until now. Introducing Helix Sleep. You buy your mattress online, and it's customized for both of you. That's right, each side of the bed for hundreds of dollars instead of thousands. And our listeners go to helixsleep.com slash joey. That's H-E-L-I-X sleep.com slash joey. And you get $50 off of your first order. That's $50 off of your order. Helixsleep.com slash joey. Helixsleep.com slash joey. And the show is brought to you by onnit.com. Go to onnit.com and use code word church to get 10% off all of their great optimization products. I was lucky enough to get some new of their Dolce Whey protein. I'm going to try that out and let you know how it is. It's onnit.com, code word church. Wahoo! You bad motherfuckers. Kick that horse, Lee. Ba ba. Boom, 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 boom. Oh shit. Oh shit. It's pedophile night here tonight. Oh shit. Here we go, motherfucker. Here we go. Here we go. Lisa at in the motherfucking house. Oh shit. It's a Monday night, cocksucker. Oh. Uh uh-uh. uh. It is close to midnight in some places. Something evil's fucking lurking. You get an eight ball. You bump into some strange chick with a missing eyeball and an eye patch. After a couple bumps, you're like, fuck it. You try to scream. But you say, fuck it. This chick is terrifying me. Will she suck my dick with the eye patch? Oh, shit. Disgusting. Let me tell you something, all right? Let me tell you how fucking the FBI is as dumb as they come. <laughs> Took them a month to crack the fucking phone. Meanwhile, there's a fucking kid in Jersey who could have cracked that in two fucking days. Well, th- what they were saying was, uh, is that like they could have cracked it a while ago, but yeah, they were trying to get ridiculous. Apple to do it. Yeah, they th- they're fucking lazy. Like they, they could have done it in two fucking days. <laughs> but let me tell you how stupid the FBI is. If I was the FBI right now, I would dig up Gravano. I would go visit Gravano in the prison. Mr. Gravano, you probably got what left on your sentence. They're going to give you parole. You're this age. How about when you go home, you go home. That's it. No chapter of the government with Sammy the Bull. God, he's dead. Everybody's dead. We want the whole thing on Trump. The oh, whole file shit, on Trump. Yeah. We want the deals. We want the payoffs, how they were made, who collected the money, and then you take that to Trump and go, listen, we ain't going to tell nobody. We ain't going to tell nobody. This is between us. We're friends. Right. This secret is between us. Now, anytime the FBI asks for something, Trump will have to give it to them. You like, follow me? Like they're going to blackmail him when he's president? It's not blackmail. Blackmail, that's a big fucking word right there. Okay? <laughs> blackmail is a bad word. It's letting you know that I know. I've always told you that's the biggest thing when you're out there is letting motherfuckers know. Somebody's at a party and they're talking shit about you, right? Some right. people go and attack that dude. You don't say nothing for fucking two years. <laughs> and one night when it's you and him alone, you drop it on him and you watch him break. And that's what happens because people can't believe they said shit that came back to haunt them, but not right away. But what about the mob itself? Like, wouldn't the mob be doing the same thing to him if he gets to be president? The mob, the mob that's in now doesn't know. That was 30 fucking years ago. Oh. His dealings were between 80 and 85, 86, So that's over now? 88, yeah. That connection died. Gravano took that with him. Yeah, they own SNA Construction, and they have different companies that the mob... The mob has a 2% club, okay? 2% of the profit goes to the mafia. What they do is they get 16 fucking people, companies. Lee Syak Construction, Joey Diaz Construction, and we go into a a bidding club. So now instead of us bidding for jobs, you just get the job. For 2%. So this million, but any job over $2 million. So the concrete, you got to buy from my company. Now, let me explain something to you. Concrete per square foot in Oklahoma, I'm just making these numbers up. 
is $35 a square foot. Again, I'm just making these numbers up. I don't want people on Twitter hit me, Joey, I live in Oklahoma, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I'm just making these numbers up. But when you deal with SNA construction, his concrete is 8250 <gasps> a square foot. That's the mob squeeze. So they take 2% and then they, they <clears throat> and fuck you. And then they you. fuck you on that. Oh my and then God. they control different unions. Let's say they have the laborers union or the fucking pipe fitters union. That's how they work. Now, for them not to shake you down, you have to pay them back. You have to be in the thing. I know Trump's personality. Trump didn't want to be in the bid club. Trump said, fuck it, I'll make you a partner. Okay? And that's how... Now, the construction was really New York tight between that, those years when Trump was in. And the guy that ran construction, if you want to look this up at home, if you have the time and you're that much of a fucking stiff, the guy who ran the construction in New York was a guy by the name of Sammy the Bull Gravano. He was an underboss with a Gambino crime family. He had 18 different uh, companies, all related to the construction field. Glass, piping, architecture. Electrical. Electrical. Mm -hmm. Because if you... So now, Lee Syatt was only getting one job every three months. But Lee Syatt is fighting for his life. He's bidding these fucking okie dog jobs. One day the mind of Lee Syatt says, wait a second. He gets down and he starts writing notes. And he comes up with, even if I give half of my profits at these inflated pr prices, I make money. So instead of getting two jobs a year, I get six jobs a year and I split the profits. I'm busy all year. I still make more money than I was ever making before. Let me approach Sammy the Bull and make him a partner. Wait, no. No, you come to me and okay. go, Sammy, how about I give you 40% of my company, make you a partner, give you a taste, give you a tax return, make you VP of uh, whatever, give you like a fake fucking job. You follow me? Like the one Tony had in like the there you garbage go. place, right? <clears throat> there you go. So now, when, when Sam, Sammy the Bull was a genius, because now when he gets, he's got a taste of all those companies. Plus, he was getting partners and he was shooting them. <gasps> and then taking the whole company from them. How could he pull that more than once? Like, I feel like after the second time, they'd be like, maybe we shouldn't be partners. Partners started disappearing. All his mate, D.B. DiBernardo, the guy in Staten Island, all his, his brother-in-law. He killed his wife's brother, Doug. Why? Because he was causing a lot of fucking problems. But to just keep this on Trump, that's how crazy. Like, I'm looking at this world news tonight because Trump's a fucking genius, okay? Trump's got so much money that he's just paying. Listen, you ever see a fucking law and order? Yeah. When I go, Lisa Yat was involved in gay porn. That's irrelevant. Uh, I object. Uh, I'm sustained. That sustained don't mean dick because the jury heard that right, already. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what he's doing is he's blowing up little fires and all these fucking little magazines that every that you read while you're online at the supermarket. Those what do you call those things? You know, time. Well, not time, but like uh, uh, the tabloids. Tabloids. I'm sorry, I don't know. I forget the words sometimes. I smoke dope. And but shit. then, so so he lights fires. Right. I come up to you and say, listen, what if I gave you? What if? What if? I gave you a picture of Ted Cruz with a blonde, and two hundred thousand dollars. What if? I could fucking Photoshop that. I can meme that. Don't they? Don't what they do when they take pictures? And yeah, they could put do somebody anything. Somebody else's head now. These college or kids. Or even even if he just, just puts it out there on like Fox News or any any TV thing. If he just said, well, you know, I heard Ted Cruz likes to play with monkeys. I don't know what anything. Just the fact that he said it. <laughs> That's it. It's out there now. You're waiting for your groceries and you look up and boom. Ted Cruz involved in sex gamble. <laughs> now, what happens? Because he has casinos in Vegas and Atlantic City. The mom has to be involved in casinos, right? Well, I know you him, don't know. He made them corporate. Okay. See, once the corporations took over the casinos, that made it a little tougher for that skin. And they know it. But they get taken care of in other ways, which I don't really know. I really don't know. I, you know, you hear all these rumors the mob is gone from Vegas. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know none of that shit. I don't know who exists anymore. I don't know what the fuck goes on. But I do know that I was watching that tonight, and I'm like, Trump is such a swindler that some he's going to win, but somebody should swindle him. And you know who could swindle him? The FBI. 
the FBI can swindle him and have their fucking way with them. The Jesus. president, the vice president, whoever runs the FBI can get whatever he wants and fucking support the next four or five, six, eight years. Oh, my God, yeah. If, I mean, if he does that to him, which is crazy to think about strong-arming the president, whatever, whatever you want to call it. That's it. Hey, listen, they couldn't strong-arm Kennedy. They shot him in the fucking head. They blew his fucking brain out. Whoever the fuck did that? Whoever yeah. the fuck did that, okay? That's... It gets scarier and scarier. Like, the more I see... Like, I, I'm, I'm sure this has been going on forever, but I was just too, too young and naive to see it. But, like, the more and more you see with, like, the political system and the way it works... Well, like People don't pay attention to the political system. They think because they watch CNN politics, they know what politics really are, and they don't. They don't. They don't. Why do I give Why do I give Jed Bush $200,000 of my hard-earned money? Because I have something I want to do. Yeah. There's something I want to do. I want to zone that neighborhood. I want to do something. So th- th- it's a dirty fucking business right there. Do you think that's a job? Like they go through the donor list at a certain point after they get elected and they're like, okay, well, we have to pay off these amount. At over $100,000 they have to pay off If I come favors. to you in this business, in this fucking presidential debate, Okay. And with all this, whatever it's called. And I come to a presidential guy, a candidate, let's just call him. And I say to him, listen, over the years I've been accused of doing a lot of things. But I'm really a hot dog salesman. I have 35 hot dog stands all across the country. And I have a name and I make millions of dollars a year selling hot dogs. Yes, Mr. Diaz, selling hot dogs. But my real business... Is drugs. Let's just say. Let's say I make twenty million dollars a year, fifteen million dollars a year, three million cash to me is nothing. I would donate it to a presidential debate, whatever the fuck, a presidential candidate, because I know that in the in the future, I want to expand my business. I want to expand my business. I want to go to Mexico. I want to go to Europe. I want to expand my business and double that. If I get caught, I need a presidential. I need something. I would do it. You know, to see, these are the things that You have to assume happen. they're doing it. That money's coming from somewhere. When a, when, a, when a medical supply company, not a medical supply company, a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company comes up with a new pill, and they're having a tough time with the FDA. They know Lee Syatt is a senator of fucking Wisconsin. He's tight with the vice president of the FDA. I'll give 500000 to your donation, a million dollars, because I know you're going to, but there's a, once I go to your fundraiser, that's why I'm going to whisper in your ear what I need from you. And then... If and you say no, thing. you're not going to get that money again, what you need. What you need. I Especially get... that type of, those type of digits. Listen, I went to get a nose spray the other day. It was $80. Oh, a, yeah, prescription? Yeah, $80. But I went today to get a pill, and it was $1.16. <laughs> so you never fucking know. They get you somewhere or the other. They really do. And and now it's getting to the point where, like CVS, right? I can't get, like, whenever I get sick here... I go to the clinic because you can't get a doctor's appointment within like two weeks. I have like pretty decent insurance. So I'm paying CVS to go to the clinic. I'm paying CVS for the pills. And, and so they have all, they, they're making all the money. Like that's, it's crazy what we allow. Hey, for $35 when I was growing up, a doctor come to your house and give you a shot of penicillin in the prescription. Right. And now I have to wait two weeks even though I have insurance. And they raise your, they raise my insurance every year. It's fucking crazy. It's just, and that's why I, th- I think Bernie Sanders is, is so popular. I don't really know. Like, I know what he's talking about. I don't know if it's going to if pe- – because no matter who you talk to, either they ha- hate Trump or they hate Sanders. So you don't know who's what's real. But I can see that. I'm paying 350 right now for insurance that and I, that's, that's I can't really use. Yeah, yeah. There's people um, listening to the podcast. I can't imagine it. If you don't have insurance today, you're getting fucking raped. And it's tough. Either way, you're getting fucked in the ass. But it's – you got to have the insurance. I went for years without insurance. How? I don't fucking know. How? I do not fucking know. I went to like 35 with no insurance, just living on the edge. Until I joined SAG, I didn't have insurance. Jesus. That was so what were you doing? You got sick. You three, just... six, 19, 20 years ago. So I was 33 years old, 34 years old, and I got fucking insurance. So what would you do if you got time. sick? I toughed it up. I went to the pharmacy like everybody else. I inhaled vitamin C. If it was one time I went to the hospital for my throat, I got a throat infection. And in Colorado, that's never come up on my fucking uh, credit report. Really? I don't know what the hell happened to it? 200 
one time I had an abscess in a tooth. I, I went to Cedar Memorial, whatever, on Beverly. I never heard of that bill either. They probably figured out I had SAG insurance. and That's crazy. So this weekend I went to Paducah. Yeah. <clears throat> I went to Paducah with my uh, wife and the baby. and uh, They had a great time. And I was sitting there for a little while. You know, and I was sitting outside looking at the horses and all this land. They have horses? Oh. Yeah, my fucking brother-in-law's got three horses right there in the yard. The yard is the size of this fucking neighborhood. <laughs> they got a three-bedroom house with the side with a barn, a fucking camper, and then three horses fenced off. Just, it's got to be a couple football fields. Gee, that must have been fun yeah, for Mercy. Over. Oh, Mercy hasn't fucking stopped running, but... I was sitting there, and I thought of a friend of mine that I hadn't spoken to in a long fucking time, since 1993. I just thought of him. And I see his brother on Facebook all the time. And there was rumors growing up, you know, later on. But I realized while I was sitting there how much I loved this kid growing up. Like, he was just, he was just a dynamite, fun kid. His name was Fernie. And Timmy Holloway's probably listening to him right now. Fernie was one of these kids that it was two of me. Like, his tolerance was through the roof. No way. He, oh, his he, tolerance he more tolerance was, than you? Oh, his tolerance was through the roof with everything. With everything. Whatever he did, he did double. From his gambling to his weightlifting. I mean, he was a kid that had a fucking body like an Adonis. His shoulders were huge growing up. We always knew each other since the seventh, eighth grade from playing basketball. But we didn't talk. We just waved at each other and, hey, what's up? Then we became freshmen together. And we'd talk at parties. And he always showed up with, like, you know, if you had a $10 bag, he always had a $20 bag. Was Who he a rich kid? Buy? No, his father had a restaurant in Edgewater, New Jersey that was called H&B Diner, right by the, where they shot Copland. It was right over there. It was a tremendous little fucking greasy spoon, but he made the best pork sandwiches on Italian bread with hot sauce and pickles. Fresh Cuban fucking pork with on Italian bread with Swiss cheese and fucking hot sauce. Pork and Swiss cheese? Good googly moogly. Good googly moogly, and he'd, and he'd melt the Swiss cheese over the fucking bread. You have no idea, my friend. But Fernie and me became tight. It was me, Fernie, Roger, and this kid by the name of Glenn Conti, a.k.a. Stinky. And we became a unit, November of 81. We all hung out from time to time, but then we started getting together. Fernie was one of the first guys that really had a car. Like that his father just gave him a car and it had a hole in the back seat. He put a piece of metal on there, but when he would drive the car, the metal would move. Glenn had his mother's car from time to time, and Roger, he had his father's car he would borrow from time to time. But Fernie was always the ride. And whenever Fernie would drive, he would drive. And he'd curse at people, and he'd call people prick. He had a great prick thing. And we hung out tight. He always supported me. He always had my back, you know, no matter what. He was very quiet. I got him beat up one time at a bar in Hoboken called Gennaro's. What do you mean you got him beat up? I grabbed the girl's ass. I went When I played for St. Michael's, she was a Chile, the Cuban girl, and she was standing in front of me watching the band, and I was next to Fernie, and I reached over and grabbed her ass. It was one of these reaches, like with my right hand, so I had to cross three people. So when she turned around, Fernie had a stupid look on his face with glasses. He was just as high as I was. <laughs> and she turned around. He was drinking an Alabama Slammer with a white shirt on. And she turned around and smacked him in the face. And the, the, blood, the, the, the drink went all over his shirt. And his glasses fell off. Everybody knew he was blind without his glasses. But the funniest was that one. <laughs> the funniest one part of, the, of this. One, one of the lens fell out of his glasses. So when he got stepped on, she was kicking him, and he was looking for his glasses. <laughs> she got beat up by, he got beat up by the girl? You beat up by the girl. We're fucking howling as kids. You didn't help him out? No. You got beat up by a girl. What do you want me to do? Choke the fucking girl? I can't <laughs> choke the fucking girl. You got to take your beating. But he took the beating. <laughs> he took your beating? He took oh, my the, God. He took the beating from me like a fucking soldier. 
Did he, he did he even know why he was getting hit? No, nah, he was half retarded. He just got up, put his glasses back on, and the one lens was broken. And he had a big red stain on his fucking white shirt. And that was the end of that tune. Oh my god, I was fucking howling. But I robbed that jewelry store and while I was in Florida on the hideout. We were, uh, you know, talking on the phone. We were talking on the phone, talking on the phone, talking on the phone. Me and Fernie. For some reason, I always talk to Fernie. How can you be on the hideout and talking on the phone? Because the cops weren't really tapping phones in those days for some guy who robbed a jewelry store. Fernie, one thing I knew about Fernie is that Fernie didn't talk. Fernie didn't talk unless it was us. Like, Fernie never would talk. Like, if Fernie in those days came in the room right now, Fernie would actually just talk to me. He wouldn't talk to you. <laughs> he wouldn't even pay attention He wouldn't to even you. acknowledge my existence. He wouldn't even acknowledge you. Not because he was rude, but that was Fernie. Like, he didn't know you, and he didn't want to know you. You know? <laughs> he whatever. Had, he had enough friends. He'd show up, sit down, and whip out a bag of weed that could kill a mule. So, I come back from Florida in the hideout, and on the phone call the night before, he tells me, he goes, hey, man, I talked to my mother. You could stay here with me. And at that time, my soul was gone. Like, I was gone. Like, I, I, I had no, I didn't claim responsibility for what my actions or How who old I were was. You, roughly? 19. Okay. Just totally out of control. The world owed me a fucking thing. I was angry at the world, and I did what the fuck I wanted until I either caught a beating or was going to go to jail or whatever. And this kid opens up his home to me. He says, hey, man, fuck all that shit. We got the basement. We can bring bitches. Nobody will know. I got my weights down there. We got a bathroom. You could shower upstairs. But besides that, everything's downstairs. You could. My mother's never home, so you could shower up there in the daytime if you need to take a shower. But besides that, we got the whole downstairs. They never come down here. And it was it. That's, that's all we needed. We were smoking dope downstairs. We were doing blow downstairs. We were eating quaalude downstairs. And his parents never once were like, hey, guys. Well, one night, he ate a fucking quaalude. We got through four quaaludes. And I told him just to eat one. He ate two, and he went in the shower. We were downstairs drinking beers, fucking smoking reef. And his father came down. He goes, dog, you got to go upstairs. Freddy's asleep in the shower. We went upstairs. He was in the shower on two ludes, passed out with his socks on. We had to take him out of the shower. They're like, what happened to him? We don't know. He's saying he was tired. He was fucked up. His father. That motherfucker came downstairs, did like three lines, and it was like nothing happened. We got in the car. We were headed to go see Pat Benatar. I'll never forget that. And he kept some guy parked too close to him. Like they gave him an inch in the front and an inch in the back. I'll never forget this. <laughs> and he is putting the car in reverse. Boom. <laughs> putting the car. Boom. 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 And at that time, it's me. I'm in the back seat. No, I'm in the side seat. And Roger Holloway is in the back seat. I'll never forget this. Like it was yesterday. And he's doing this for two minutes. Boom. 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 And he's, t- you know, he's turning the wheel. But every time he makes a thing, he hits one of the fucking cars. And finally, Roger bends his head over. He goes, what are we playing? Bumper cars? <laughs> I'll never forget. You know, it was something fucking every night with him. But he was my brother. He had my, he had my back. He let me, oh shit, oh shit. He had my back, man. This guy let me move into his fucking basement. Felicia Michaels in the house. Come over and sit down, my love. Right over here. So this guy fucking let me live with him. And it was just, Felicia better get ready for this. Yes. Because it was two 19-year-old boys. We had no direction. He was working at his father's restaurant in Edgewater. And when as soon as I got back, it took me about a week to get a job. I got a job. Look at you. I got a job at a fucking place that made frames for Entenmann's cake. You what? ever go into a supermarket and see Entenmann's cake? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. And they have the fucking stands that say, you know, Entenmann's, Entenmann's, Entenmann's. That's what I did. I was a union Entenmann cake stand builder. That's not a bad job. No, it wasn't <laughs> a fucking bad job. But I spent my whole salary at that fucking diner. <laughs> because I wouldn't eat lunch at the place. So I would go there and have like a $20 lunch, like three pork sandwiches, me and Stinky. <laughs> and then they hooked us up. This whole time, I'm living with Fernie, giving him like $50 a week. 
and we're driving to his restaurant at five in the morning listening to, I'll never forget, dead of the winter, listening to Nasty Girl, Nasty Girl, do you think God, and dancing in the car and shit, three 19-year-old jerk-offs, jerk-offs, and uh, he was, what are, what are you, like I was just telling Lee, he was one of those people, he didn't smoke pot, Felicia, like if you bought a $10 bag, mm -hmm. he would buy a $25 bag and smoke the whole thing in high school. He was, I don't know all those ADHD terms today. ADD? Mm -mm. He was half retarded. He wasn't ADD. <laughs> Autistic? No. He had that shit. He had that shit that he always had to do double of what you did. We always thought Fernie would die. Like I always later on said, I wonder where Fernie is. And then I heard he went to a party at my friend's house. Like, we all know this guy. Like, it's like me going to your house with, you, with your kids there, your girlfriend's there, and going, can I use your bathroom? 20 minutes, you're like, Joey's been in that bathroom a long fucking time. 40 minutes, you're going to knock on the door. My friend knocked on the door. He didn't hear nothing. He kicked the door open. Fernie had the strap on his arm. This is like, you catching me at your house. This is like, you know. He called me in Colorado. He goes, I tell you what happened last night. I fucking found for here in my bathroom shooting heroin at five in the fucking morning. I chased him. He ran away. You know, leave me alone. And that was the last we really heard of. That was it. But what happened was I was living with him. And we had gone through like, you know, we hooked up in October. And I got to tell you guys, it was a three month party. Like him and I went to work at five, but we were out till two. Every night? Every night. There was a bar right across the street, so we could park the car and walk. So, worst case scenario, we would go into the city, not do blow. We'd go over and get reefer, park the car, smoke a joint, and then we'd cross the street. It was the Midtown Lounge, the Silver Fox. The guy was, they called him the Silver Fox. He was like 70, he'd be in there picking up chicks and shit. And we'd go in there. We, it was like a three-month tear. Finally, in December, I tapped out. We were like, I can't do this. I got a job in a lumber yard. I lived with him the whole time. I got arrested at that fucking lumber yard for possession of stolen tools. He never said nothing to me. He was my roommate, never judged me, never questioned me, he took me out for a drink. Fuck it, we'll beat the case. I mean, he was just a great guy. But I, I was living with him, and I was doing some wild shit. And I was 19. And I was straying out of the neighborhood and doing wild shit, which meant somebody was going to catch me. And one night I tried to break into a bookie's house. And I cut my hand with the barbed wire. And I had to cross. That was, I robbed that guy's house on 57th Street. I had to run to 68th Street. It doesn't seem like a lot, but I had to cross like eight avenues. When I got to his block, the cops were coming down the block with the light. And I had to hide under a car. And I'm like, I gotta, if I want to be friends with this guy, I got I to gotta move out of his house. Because something's going to happen. And this house is going to get shot up. I was doing some crazy shit. I was fucking with some Cubans in Union City. That was when they were bringing cocaine up. And they had apartments. And I would break into their apartments. I knew I was going to get in trouble. And a friend of mine came up to me. because I want to go to Colorado. And I, 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 and I thought about it. And I said, okay. And I didn't have the heart to tell Fernie I was leaving. Like, I never had the heart to call, sit him down and go, Fernie, I'm leaving. So while he was at work... I packed my stuff and I wrote a letter and left it for him. Like that's how much I love Fernie. I was a confused kid, I didn't really know. I left and after about a month I called him, we were friends, but I could see that we weren't the friends that we were. Like, But then I came back and we were, then we were tight again. Then he got involved in gambling, then he hit somebody with the car. And he picked me up two days later after he hit the dude with the car. And that was the first time somebody hit somebody with a car and told me a story, and I actually pissed my pants. That's how funny. Like, that's how crazy he was. He was smoking a joint. And you know when you cut through a gas station? Mm -hmm. Instead of waiting for the red light? Oh, yeah. He cut through the gas station. When he hit the sidewalk, oh, the no. ash fell on his shirt. <laughs> and while he was going like this, there was a guy waiting for the fucking bus. Oh. And he clipped the dude. And he got out of the car, and if you know Fernie, like if you know Fernie, when he was telling me this, I know he ain't lying to me, I knew him. He said he told the dude, I go, Fernie, what happened? He goes, I had to go with the car. You know, he was, I was a little stoned, I didn't want to wait for the cops. He goes, I was running late for work. So I told the dude, either get up or do something, because I got to get to work. And he took off. 
And he got home that night, and he was in the shower, and the cops fucking ripped him out of the shower, beat him <laughs> up and shit. <laughs> oh, my God. But, again, by this time, we were 20, maybe 21, maybe, maybe. Now, in those days, you watch vinyl. Mm -hmm. they, if you watch vinyl, they all have a little glass with a thing, and you... Now, once it got advanced, a chain with a spoon came on that thing. So you would take the cap off and do little bumps. Now, in those days, I could lie to you and tell you I did eight balls. No, I didn't. I always had one of those things. Not Fernie. Fernie would drive around with a quarter ounce of blow. But here's where it got crazy. He would cut his own blow. So he would buy a fucking eighth of Coke and he would cut it three and a half to three and a half to dilute it. And he would he would cut it till it was like fucking speckled. Like you weren't <laughs> even getting high. And he'd sit in his car with like the ace of spades and talk to you for like twenty minutes and he'd just keep doing bump. He was over. What's that O C D. He yeah, did yeah. everything more. Like Washing you, his hands a lot. Like did he you do sit, stuff like that. Like he did the, like again, you know, people do and they put it down and they talk to you. Not Fernie. Oh, no. He had to have the mirror, his own mirror. And he would just do fucking monsters every minute on the minute. Ch -ch -ch -ch. And you would look at him and go, when is this going to fucking... So what happened to him? So, 83, 84, boom. I go to Colorado. I get arrested. Ba -ba -ba. I come back to Jersey in 91, 92. I'm looking for Fernie. No Fernie. I come back in 93 after I get divorced. No Fernie. Nobody's seen Fernie. His mother still lives there. She drives the school bus. She parks the bus in front of the house. There's no Facebook and there's no Twitter. Do you know my friend Timmy Holloway's brother invites me to his house to dinner in Jersey City. I take the bus and I have to do a transfer and I get off and I start walking a little bit. And who do I bump into on a fucking street corner? But Fernie with some broad. He gives me a hug. I hugged him. He goes, I heard you're doing comedy now. I said, I'm trying, man. It's fucking hard. He goes, let me come see you one night. And in that whole thing, the girl looks at him and goes, is this the kid you told me about? Oh. And he goes, yeah. And he gave me some number. And I called him like 10 times. He never returned my call. And that was it. Do you regret just leaving the letter? Like, do you think that might have been it? Always. Till this fucking day, I regret leaving that goddamn letter. He was my brother. He wouldn't have given a fuck. If I would have told him the truth, he wouldn't have given He knew that I was crazy. So what did you say in the letter then? That I loved him. That I had to leave. That 20 people were looking for me. That I would have loaned Shark $10,000. And I needed some fucking space before I got killed. I didn't want to bring it into his house. And do you, like, you wish you had just said that to him? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I would have said it to him. Well, why do you think he never answered the phone or contacted you back? Well, you know, if if he would have understood, why didn't... I think by that time he was gone. Today, he has HIV mm -hmm. from shooting heroin. I heard this, and I looked at the pictures on Facebook. And I was like, yeah, he's got something. He's very hidden. Nobody's ever seen him. No more reunions. No nothing. So over the weekend, I'm in Paducah, and I'm sitting there giggling over one of his stupid fucking escapades. Like, just a thought came into me, how he used to fuck this skinny girl. I saw at the airport, and it looked like the girl. And I said, oh, my God, that girl was really pretty, but she was really bony. And I used to say, funny, she don't have a pussy. <laughs> and he goes, she got it in there somewhere. It's good. <laughs> you know, he, he was always, when I robbed the fucking janitor, and I had the epileptic pills. Everybody was mad at me for giving them epileptic pills. Like, people were like, Joey, you're my friend. You gave me those pills. You know what Fernie told me? Those fucking pills were good, man. <laughs> you got to get me some more of those. He was popping those and walking around and driving. Yeah. People were sleeping for three days. And, like, he was one of those guys. Like, even the epileptic pills didn't affect them. Yeah. Like, he was one of those fucking dudes. And I already got the heroin and stuff. So, to make a long story short, I'm sitting there watching Mercy run around. 
and you would get those thoughts like what type of friends will they have growing up and for some reason I thought about my friends I thought about Fernie and last night I come home and I'm on Facebook and who pops up on Facebook but Fernie he added you as a friend no 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 like a picture of Fernie his brother oh uh, okay so I went to the brother's page and in the corner there's Fernie and he's bald and he's like, he's got, he still has, the, he had fucking shoulders. That's the guy who taught me how to do the behind the necks. He was behind the neck in 185. And he goes, you can do it. And he would, he would do 165. His neck started here and it went here and his waist was like this. Women would jump on this guy. Is that the picture you used to have in your old office? No, 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 okay. that's Rago. This was another kid that was taller. His waist was like this. He mm-hmm. was built like this. No steroids, just push-ups, stakes. Those pork sandwiches and all heavy weight. He believed in heavy weight. So I get home last night and I see this fucking picture. And against everything I got, I said, you know what? I clicked on to the message thing and I wrote, after 20 years, I still think about you. And I put send. And I said, this motherfucker is going to see this and never say nothing to me. I wake up this morning, there's one single message. Didn't even expect it to be him. I always wake up a few messages on I click on, open it up, and he wrote, I think of you too. And I said, I could open this conversation up or leave it here. I go, I'm going to leave it right here. Just let it stew. Because this kid was my fucking dog. Dog, dog, dog. Funny, Felicia, off the cuff, like retarded funny, mm-hmm. like the shit he would say. Just retarded. Just retarded funny. Can I ask, how come you just let it lay? Why? why? That crew never recovered. That crew never recovered. Two out of the four became Christian guys. You know, uh, the guy that says shit in the morning. Born again. Not born again. The one became uh, whatever, the dude, the good-looking dude in Houston with the church. Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen, the UPS one, Mm -hmm. and the other one, Roger, also became a born again Christian. That's how deep those times were. Like what we were thinking and what we were doing was not what eighteen year olds did. It wasn't what eighteen year olds did, you know, and it was just a uh, heart. And Fernie at that time he had a gambling addiction. Again, we're betting forty timers. You know the forty timers? Two hundred bucks. Me and you together. Who do you like tonight? You like the next. Let's bet the next. Do you want to split a 200 time? Let's split a 40 time. First time he comes to me, he goes, what are you guys always talking about? You gamble? Really? How much you gamble? We're like, well. So he started doing math. After 10 minutes, he goes, what if I put down a $1,000 parlay? Who does that the first time? Nobody does that. That's when you bet two teams, and they both have to win. I was living with him. I'm in the basement, across from him, in the bed. And he's telling me this shit. And under his bed, he's got a jar filled with 150s. And he goes, if I lose, I could cover this. He goes, so what do I do? I go, call my friend's dad. A thousand time parlay. Seattle and somebody else. What does that win? (laughs) You can't even fucking imagine what it wins. 18 years old, calls it in. The first game wins outright. The second game, it's 27 nothing at halftime. We both smoke a joint, we go to bed, I kind of giggle in the way, fuck them. We both wake up, Seattle comes back and beats 28, 27, he wins a thousand bucks. My friend's dad calls him back and he goes, if you want to come pick up the money. He goes, get dressed. Let's go pick up the money. Let's go out for the best dinner we've ever had. We go to Picolissimo. This is the spot, Jack. Fucking waiters with the, the fucking suits. <laughs> White people, Fort Lee, New Jersey, <clears throat> overlooking the Hudson. People kissing, glass wines. I never saw that before in my life, all that shit. I go in there. I used to go in there on little dates. And with friends at the lobster fry Diablo dish. I go, Fernie, what do you want to eat? And he goes, I don't know. I go, I'll get the lobster fried the He goes, I've never had lobster before. I go, that's even more of a reason to get it. 
Monster Fry Diablo, they brought you a dish shaped like a fucking fish, Felicia, and it had pasta in the middle. Then all around it had clams and mussels, and, and on the top was a fucking lobster tail with four huge fucking prawns, Felicia, to, with red spicy sauce with a big loaf of bread with butter. Come on, Felicia. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendous. We yeah, go in there, yeah. he fucking devours his plate. He's thirsty, and he drinks the finger bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Picked up the fucking finger bowl and drank it yeah. like nothing, like nothing. And after that, he went on a gambling tear. He was up sixty thousand dollars under his bed. Yeah, eighteen mm. years old. Wow. And he lost it all on the Super Bowl plus thirty, and that cracked him. And the bookie made him pay, so he had to pay every week. Three hundred, four hundred dollars every week. He paid the guy till he owed him eight hundred. He told the guy to go fuck himself, and that cracked him. He never watched sports again, never, ever, not even as a joke. When I bumped into him ninety three, I go, "You watch sports again?" He goes, "Never again." He wouldn't even watch. Never. Fuck. Lose <laughs> ninety thousand. Yeah, that's that's crazy. And back then, back then, when two dollars, eighty-two, yeah, when the dollar was worth twice the amount it's worth now, that Miami, was a tremendous amount of money, man. The Killer Bees against the Redskins. That was the Super Bowl. He lost his ass on, and he became a different person. <laughs> like after that, at eighteen, he became. He had to get a job at a gas station from four to twelve, and then he worked at his father's restaurant from six to four. Wow. So he only slept. On Saturday and Sunday, and he did that for eight months until he paid the thirty or forty grand off. Did his parents know that that had happened? He had to go to his parents yeah. and borrow twenty from them, and it was ugly. Oh wow! So, so you're happy with how your conversation? Like that's why you don't really want to go for it. Like it was as that's perfect all as I it needed. could be. Yeah. That's all I needed from him. If I, if you knew this kid. If I engage him right now, I might. I'm just gonna leave it there. That's as good as it gets in my world for me. What are you supposed to do when you lose friends? Like I have that friend who I went to his wedding in Vermont. He was my 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 best friend in high school, and I didn't have like a bunch of friends. He was my like my best friend, and he for the past couple months he won't answer my call. I don't know what to do. People get married, people change. You don't know what his life is. Well, I just had a friendship that kind of went kaput with someone who was very close to me. And I think people don't understand that friendships, just like relationships, aren't meant to be forever. That doesn't mean they have any less value. You know, I think sometimes uh, people are in your life for a certain period of time to bring clarity to that time but but when you have children you don't teach children or we don't teach each other that it's okay if you're not friends anymore yeah. but but maybe we should teach them how to disengage a friendship you know well I have a different frame of thought like when I didn't talk to you for a while mm -hmm. I still loved you yeah, we were just mad at each other. Yeah. That was completely. I didn't want to lose your friendship. We were kind of mad at each other. <laughs> yeah, but I still loved you. After I came to my senses, I yeah, really did miss yeah. you. I miss all my friends. Yeah. I miss all my friends. Like when Chucky McBrain, I miss. Like it's basketball the other day. I'm watching basketball and I thought about Chucky fucking McBrain. I'm like, how many fucking stupid games did me and that fucking moron go to? Now he's a basketball coach at Ramapo or whatever, you know, and just, we were talking about college basketball last week and how the players, I used to write the coaches and, and uh, I didn't lose Chucky. We grew apart and we connected, not even on Facebook. He hunted me down and Today we talk every 90 days. You know, I know he's busy with college, but we never stop mm -hmm. loving each other. Then there's the people you grow away from, and it's naturally. Somebody gets married, somebody has a kid, somebody stops getting high, you yeah, know? Yeah, somebody yeah. gets a DUI, and people put fucking blame. I had something in December that happened to me that was just horrible. I, I went back east with my family, and I got those Hilton fucking points. And a week before I went, Hilton fucking hit me up and said, we'll either give you a room for free one night or we'll take a room off your tab. 
So I called one of my best friends in life. And I go, hey, man, what are you doing next weekend? Why don't you come up, bring the wife, see the baby, we'll go get some Chinese food, we'll smoke a couple of joints. And he goes, that's not a bad idea. This is 40 fucking years, Felicia. Mm-hmm. You know, he spent millions on me, this kid. I call him back, I go, come up, we'll go to dinner. Yeah, 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 yeah. In one of the conversations, he calls me back and he goes, hey, man, I'm thinking of bringing my kids. I go, dog, I'm bringing a kid. I'm not calling you to see the kids. I'm calling to see you. He goes, all right, I'll call you tomorrow. He didn't call me back. Yeah. I was like, I opened my fucking mouth. I said something about the kids. I really don't like his girlfriend's boyfriend. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. I know she's a fucking baby. I was in the fucking outside when she was getting delivered. And she's been dating this creepy motherfucker since she's like 17, showing up in my comedy shows with him and it eats me alive. I'm one of those yeah, dudes, yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm that uncle that just, ah, and I can't say nothing. And I'm like, like he was telling me he lives at the house with him. That sent me into mm-hmm. a fucking loop. Like, I was like, what? This is, you let this guy live under the same roof with her in your fucking house. Like, right. this isn't the guy I know, but I guess you make exceptions for your daughters. You know, yeah, I guess yeah. you say this is the guy that she likes and she wants. So I said it as a joke. It was true. I wanted to see him. His niece sent me a picture of me and him in high school hugging. And I go, oh, what the fuck? Wouldn't it be nice? So for three months, I was like, there goes 40 years. He called me two weeks ago and he goes, he's still mad at me. I'm not mad at you. Jeez, I'm never, I could never be mad at him. Mm-hmm. Never. After all we went through, I don't get You can't come up, just call me. But. He, he said, I was embarrassed, Cokes. I got shit going on in my life. You don't know, but okay. I right. accepted. Now we've been talking. He's taking a flying out for Black Sabbath at the Hollywood Bowl and doing acid with me the whole time. And that makes me feel good like that. Like, we could reconnect. Like, I, feel, I feel bad. Like I didn't get him a gift for his wedding. But I like. But you flew out there. I flew that was out a there. G-note and a tuxedo and, and a, shoes and, 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 and dinners and a rental car. So, like, I just, yeah, I maybe that's do his it. woman saying, "Hey, yeah. get no, no, your no, gift." That's no, a, no, I'm, I'm yeah. close with his with his wife. I and I was thinking, of, honestly, you because I was thinking about maybe calling his wife because we're close. But I was like, I don't want to go around somebody. No, call. Yeah. Listen, call what's going wife? on? They haven't called me back. Maybe there's something going on. I don't know, but maybe this kid had a fucking heart attack. Oh. He's in the hospital room and she's watching him every night. Maybe his father's sick. You don't fucking know these things. Right. So just call the wife and go, hey, I don't mean to pry, but I've been calling for three months. Nobody calls me back. Is everything okay? Is there anything I could do? But then here's the thing. Like, I had a, a friend, and I'm not going to name names, that we were super, super close. And then <coughs> I could tell, you know, when someone starts shining you, you can fucking tell, right? What's shining? You know, when someone's like not, like kind of dodging you, but they're not really coming. You, you, and you, when you do hang out, you can feel the energy's kind of fucked up. Did right? they owe? What? Did they owe? No. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, and then I said to this person, like, what's up? And, and then she had like this whole fucking list of shit that I had done over like three or four months. And and it was like you have a fucking list, you have a list, you know. And some of it was like because I teased her about uh, her outfit once, but it was like, oh, you're so adorable in that outfit. And then she got upset at that, and then she got mad because I said something about her friend that wrote thank you cards, made her daughter learn how to write, like stupid shit like that. And then she got this is when I was like, okay, uh, I have to disengage for a while. She got upset. Because uh, my son and me were watching Comedy Central, and on Comedy Central, someone said, oh, that's a basic bitch. But as we were watching it in the kitchen, I was actually on Match.com, but I had my computer uh, up, you know, my laptop where he couldn't see I was on Match.com. And he goes, Mom, what's a basic bitch? And I turn the computer around, and I go, all these guys on Match.com, basic bitches, right? And we laugh so hard. So I tell my friend that. And then she's like, I was so offended that you and your son had that conversation. You told me that story. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding? Yeah, she was just looking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, why? What the fuck is that about? And when someone starts making a list, it's like, fuck that. Did she have like a written down list? She didn't have a written down list, but when I was like, what's going on? I feel like there's this weirdness, and I had to kind of corner her, and then she's like, well, it's this, this, and this. And then she goes, let's make an appointment next week, and we'll talk about what our problems are with each other. And I'm like, 
the only problem I have is that my best friend don't like me anymore. That's the only fucking problem I have. Like, you have a fucking list, you know? And I said to her, you know, when you have a friendship, there's shit that you say in front of your friend that your friend gets annoyed. She said stuff in front of me, like how she doesn't have kids and how she was saying shit about kids on a plane. Like, and you know, like, before I had kids, that... You know, I used to think the same things. And no matter what someone would have told me, I would have never understood what fucking having kids is like. And so uh, I said to her, well, sometimes you're really fucking mean about kids and how parents don't take care of their kids on a plane. And and, and then I get all pissed off for like a a millisecond. But then I realize you have that right to think that. And there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to change that. So who gives a fuck? I'm not mad about it. Let's, you know, who gives a fuck, you know? But, but some people will, like, just take out of the air little tiny things that have nothing to do with you. And then you have to understand that friendship sometimes is letting that person have their moment, and, but that you don't have to buy into their shit. That's not you. That's him. You don't have to worry, even though you miss the friendship. You right. don't have to carry it around. No, I know. But then, like, I, I feel bad. Like, I haven't... It's really tough. I don't know. When you go to college... And you come out and start working, you're so focused on all that stuff. I just, I wasn't really a great friend. I didn't call that often. But then again, like, no one, whenever I feel like that, I'm like, no one, well, I don't, I'm not, like, denying call. I'm not, like, ignoring calls from all these people. So it's a two-way street, but it's still, like, you never want to lose someone. So I'm a fucking animal. I've told Felicia for years. <laughs> and Lee and I were having a conversation. And Felicia tonight. has felt it. <laughs> and, and Lee and I were having a conversation at dinner tonight. I know you've had this com- uh-huh. you've had this thought. Comedy is a great thing to do. Life is great, but comedy is even better because you really get to learn the little things about life. That while you're suffering as a stand-up comic, you're learning things that most people won't see about human beings and how people treat you on the road and how you've been stuck in certain situations. And a complete stranger has bailed you out. And in my world tonight, I was talking to Lee about drugs. You know, and we were talking about the disgusting things I did on Blow with Women. Just animalistic, disgusting things that didn't make me feel any... uh, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, you meet somebody, they're with somebody, you give them a bump of coke, next thing you know, you swap and spit finger them in the bathroom. Meanwhile, the date is at the bar. And you're sitting there, and you go home, and you go, what the fuck just happened? What the fuck just happened? And you go, you know what? This is what comedy is all about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why question it? I'm not going to question life in the right, little things. Right, yeah. And you can't talk about this on stage. But believe it or not, I think of all those people. I still think of the stinky, hot chick that picked me up in Ogallala, Nebraska. I still, like, I wish I knew her name so I would have looked her up on Facebook and thanked her for the kind thing she did. In 1995, when I was a fucking starving, doing a triple run, mm-hmm. and the axle on my car broke down. And she picked me up hitchhiking. No bra on, Felicia. It was like one of those episodes of, remember the hitchhiker on HBO? Right, Late night, right. the guy would be hitchhiking, and some hot chick would pick him up and suck his dick and then drop him off. And mm-hmm. What a life. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You're like, <laughs> Jesus, I'm thinking about hitchhiking. <laughs> this was perfect until she started saying, well, you come back to my place. Wait till my friends meet you and we all pray together. I'm like, wait a second. What are you talking about praying? <laughs> you just threw that curveball in. We were just going to go back and eat and dinner and have a great time and would pray. She goes, well, I live in a thing, a commune, and we pray at night. You're more than welcome to come over and eat and spend the night. I'm like, oh, listen, drive me to the gas station. It's over. <laughs> my little fantasy just escaped. Even her. Yeah. Like, you think about all these people. Like, I do. I do. And I'm an animal. But when you had those moments of being with chicks like that and fingering them in a bathroom and coking them up and putting gum in their ass, whatever you're doing, (laughs) I remember that story, Uh, or the rapper in her butt. But do at the time afterwards, did you feel, and I don't know if guilt is the right word, but did you feel gross about your behavior? Absolutely. You did? But for how long? Like, ugh, and then that was over. And I'm being completely serious. Or, you know what I mean? I would like, think of where the fuck that came from. And I would write it off to the cocaine at the position where I was in my life. 
because that that's something I would you know listen when you're out drinking and doing it's it's like it's like the comedy store we were discussing the other night if you really think back about the disgust fest that was you know everybody on the outside thought it was a great time for comedy but if they really looked into the inside it became an evil thing yeah it was pretty gross you know and yeah. that's that drug trend of bringing your friend's girlfriend home or your friend's wife or you know whatever the fuck you're doing that's not home it's fun you know while you're doing it but then you think back and you go she's a mom today Mm -hmm. One night we had two cocks in a fucking mouth and a, and, a, and a cork up her asshole and she's barking and shit. Mm -hmm. Today she's driving the kid to the seventh grade like nothing. You know, and you think right. about this and you see them and you're happy that their life worked out. You don't know how many girls on Facebook uh, that I grew up with that were fucking savages. And now I see them, yeah. they got a baby, their life changed. God bless them. Like, you're like, God. I thought about all those people, Felicia, whether I fucked around with them or not. If you came into my journey, God forbid you gave me a ride or fed me or gave me a joint for the road. Oh my God, I still think of those people, like people who drove me to the trailways to get a bus. You meet those people on the road. You ever get to a town one night early? <sighs> I think about uh, one time I was doing a gig and I had, this is when I was first doing comedy and I had a 1970 Mustang and it was a piece of shit and I had to drive to do the comedy store when the comedy store was at the old Dunes Hotel in Las Vegas and I broke down in the middle of the desert and some guy came with a truck and gave me a ride all the way to Vegas and I called and got my car towed and I think about all the time like how fucking nuts is that that I got into some guy's truck yeah, in the middle of the, that. in the middle of the desert you know but that he did that kindness for me you know it's crazy I'm on the run I got caught in a, in a hotel room in San Francisco and I didn't get arrested but they were coming to get me I'll never forget this. They were coming to get me. And I took my ex-wife, and we took a bus to Reno. We got to Reno. We couldn't even get rolling papers at that time. They would throw you in jail for 22 fucking years. So we took a bus right back to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> we went uh, to the bus station. And the next morning, we woke up, and we pulled as many things as we could and shit. And we got in the fucking car. And something happened. She left the cash at the bus station, my ex-wife. The one the, from just parting all that stuff? Something weird happened. Something fucking weird happened at the bus station. She went and got a soda and put her purse down and the $800. And it, we had the karma coming to us. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, it was coming to us. We just didn't know what time. Here it was. Cops are looking for us. We're in a cab to the airport. We made the cab driver turn around, take us back to the fucking bus station. We looked, wallet was gone. Guy goes, well, you have a flight to catch. Yeah, we do. She had a flight to catch. I was going to get stuck until she went home and got more money. So we went back to the airport, and the guy gave us his business card, and we, he trusted us. And she had to go back to get the front of the jewelry that we pawned. And she called the guy, he picked her up, gave her a ride to get the jewelry, she paid him the money. He drove her right back to the airport a year later. And I still think about that fucking cab driver. What Most cab drivers would have said, fuck you. Mm -hmm. He drove us back to SFO and gave us a business card. We could have told him to fuck off and rip that card up. I said, no, we're going to pay that guy that fucking money. I don't give a fuck how we pay it. We're going to pay that guy. It was like 55 bucks. We got the guy the fucking money. I've always felt good about doing that. That's the type of shit that you make his day. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden, right, you're yeah. like, what? You remembered? Oh my God. Like in those days, I was doing a lot of bad things, but from time to time, I would do good things too. And I still remember doing that, like going back and she paid the guy the $55 plus like a $100 tip. Yeah. And he wouldn't take the tip. He was like, no, 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 I'm embarrassed. He said, no, you fucking bailed us out that night. You have no idea. I still think about that guy. That was 31 years ago. Like, what happened to that fucking dude? Like, I wish I could do a sitcom where I go looking for these motherfuckers just on. Right. Like, what happened to this guy that, uh, you know, gave me a ride to the improv that time? You know, when you're a feature act and you mm -hmm. fly in and you realize the club is 40 fucking minutes. That's a $200 cab ride. 
you basically got thirty dollars in cash. There's no ATM card when I was featuring. There was nothing. Right. You have no fucking idea how many people picked me up at the airport for free. And oh my god, I think of those people. Like I fucking don't remember their names, but I remember their faces. Which. But also, when you hear a story about someone paying someone back, like I uh, was engaged briefly to this guy after I was divorced, and he uh, got out of nowhere a thousand dollar check from Chelsea Handler and apparently like 10 years beforehand when she had just come into town he had lent her money I don't know what the situation was <laughs> I don't know but she when she made it on her show and everything 10 years later how many years later sent him the money back out of the blue and I was never a big fan of hers but I was like damn that's fucking awesome it's awesome that she did that, you know? You make somebody's fucking day like that. They, you give them faith for a day. You really give somebody faith for a day when you make that, that type of movement. When you're like, hey, 10 years ago, you gave me $82. And you're know, like, to this day, I try to give Ari 40 bucks he lent me. And he always goes, no, 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 forget it, man. I don't give a fuck. To this day, I still mm-hmm. remember him lending me 40 bucks on the road one time. When am I going to give it back? I'm like, no, 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 don't give it back. So I, 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 you know, you just think of all that shit. I wish I would have written names down. I wish I would have done like a, like I would have wrote my road log down. Like road, mm-hmm. wrote down like a diary of dates and kept it. I didn't think, you know, I didn't think. And I did have notebooks where I wrote like the day, like what I wanted to do, what I was thinking, but. It was. I would do it at night when I was coked up, so I couldn't even read it. It was hieroglyphics in the morning. I would catch one word and try to put the fucking thing together, you know. But I wish I would have run uh, like road diaries, like. Mm-hmm. And now I don't do nothing on the road. I, I go eat breakfast, a free breakfast. I fucking talk to the guy at the fucking front desk. I get him an M's at night. I go to my room. That's it. That's it. I go to my room. And I drink coffee. I watch Law and Order. That's it. <laughs> I think of my fucking life on the road now to compare to you know. When you did a gig and stayed out and fucking, but then you were featuring. You didn't even give mm-hmm, a fuck. Right. You just need to come up with twenty minutes and I'm out of there, bitch. Yeah, you yeah, know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So, but on the friend thing, I grieve over that every day. I grieve over not talking to Glenn Conti and Fernie and those guys. So to me, just knowing that he thinks about me from time to time, that made my day. Because I, I think about him, I think about sitting down with him and maybe having a conversation, but I know that I'm happy with that. If he hits me back on Facebook and mm-hmm. wants to get together, come to a show, which he won't. He was never one of those type of dudes. I could get him to a movie or maybe a Chinese restaurant. That was the most to his extent. I couldn't get him out even in those days. He didn't understand, you know. I would meet him for lunch or something. Mm-hmm. I just got together with another friend that I didn't talk to for maybe 10 years. And he was at a Salvation Army. And he was getting his life back together. He was working on an elevator or something like that. And I, I think about those dudes. I hung out with him when my mom died. I was with him every day for fucking two years, every day. You know, your kid's age. Mm-hmm. You know, that was my house. Right. He, was, he would always complain to his mom, Ma, how come you give him a bigger piece of chicken than me? What the fuck? <laughs> And he'd go, think about the fucking situation, okay? Let him get the bigger piece of chicken. Yeah. In Spanish. And he, he had an aunt that lived in the back that was crazy. Mm-hmm. So she'd be back there watching Spanish television, swatting flies. We'd just giggle at it. Yeah, we'd just giggle. And she'd go, go fuck yourself. we <laughs> lock the door on her and shit. But he just called me. So it's nice. Uh, listen, some of the other guys, man, we went our own fucking ways. Another guy hit me up two weeks ago that was a cool with me. And then when he got out of high school, he became an undercover cop and shit. And he started busting my friends. I didn't accept the friend request. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Fuck him. <laughs> Fucking douchebag. <laughs> we were tight. He knew what we were doing. That's like cheating and shit. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He busted my friends. What type of fucking guy does that mm. shit? <laughs> well, I had this friend that I met when I was 19 who was a stripper. And she was an awesome stripper. She had, like, the best costumes. She would do theme shows. She would do, you know that song, Little Red Riding Hood, where right? she'd come out in a red cape and have a little basket and give everyone little chocolate kisses. And uh, and we've had this friendship now for how many years? But sometimes we don't talk for, like, three and five years because she goes fucking crazy, and she just does crazy shit. 
but she's like my co-witness in one of the most turbulent times of my life so she always means a lot to me but she sometimes doesn't understand how a friendship should work <laughs> what's so funny what's so no funny idea. I don't know. i'm laughing because i gotta ask you a question okay ask me a question <laughs> what's going on i lose my mind i hear voices sometimes i have a tough time sleeping you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. sometimes i wake up in the middle of the night to pee and i just don't get up I just sleep with, <laughs> what does that mean? And I just sleep. And I just sleep with the fucking terror of pee inside of me for two hours <laughs> until I finally got to give in. And I pee. do it all the time. Oh my God. Really? Like what a horrible way to fucking sleep and live your fucking life when you got to pee and you're like, There's no way I'm getting fuck up. Fuck it, I'm not getting up. It's too cold to get up. <laughs> and you hold it for two hours. That's self torture. Right, like right. most countries, that's disgusting. Yeah. And you get up and you got to pee and shit. <laughs> No, the worst is when you have to fart. Oh, and no, then, I let it out. That's yeah. no I don't give a fuck about farts. And then it's not a fart. I'm too old. I fought on the plane. It was so fucking bad. It was that Paducah meat the other day. The guy next to me was sleeping, and it went into his nostrils. <laughs> he was snoring tremendous. I love when they give, the <laughs> they give that little fucking... <laughs> so, I, listen, I, and I know these things. Uh-huh. <laughs> did you ever do that, Felicia? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> when did you shit yourself? Yes. Yeah. Well, You've never no, done that. No. No. Of course I have. <laughs> yeah. Oh but what have you? Like, I, I can't imagine you ever doing. That. I didn't right. shit myself. It was just close You've to. You've never it. shit yourself. In no, the no. I didn't shit night? myself in the plane. Okay. <laughs> just a couple so. years ago, I had an incident where I had to get up. I ate those tacos. From the corner of that time, my Lancashire, I got fucked up for two days. I still did the headline spot at the improv the next night with diarrhea. You have no I idea know, what I know. to be up there holding your ass tight. You can't laugh. You can't sneeze. You can't giggle. One time my sister-in-law, she got the flu, and she's like, I have to sleep on a towel. And I was giving her so much shit, and then I got the flu from her, and I had to sleep on a towel. It's crazy that as a, as a comedian at one point you <laughs> just start snapping. Our girl snapped in New Jersey this weekend. Did yeah. you see that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You but can't I, snap. I don't in New think Jersey. she did. She snap or she, she was snapped. just talking about what she, she wanted to talk about. She snapped. Oh, okay. I didn't, listen, I don't listen know. to me. Do you know what comes out of my mouth at that fucking club? Yeah. Okay. That club, I worked that motherfucker raw. That's my back fucking yard. Do you understand me? Mm-hmm. Do you have any fucking idea? I throw down at that club because yeah, I can sure. open the valve. Yeah, it's yeah, Jersey. I'm I grew sure. up there. Yeah, I'm sure. I know all the little intricacies, yeah, yeah. And the different towns. I could say uh, where they go to spring break. Yeah. I know all that shit. Yeah. And I've never fucking had a bad set in there. They're savages. She said a rape joke. I don't know what the fuck happened last night. I don't know what the fuck happened. Something must have fucking happened. See, the people who go to see are sensitive white people. They're Gentiles. And sometimes she goes off. People. They are. They yeah. gluten free. Yeah. They drink macchinos. In Jersey too. Oh, they got them. Yeah. Oh, those people are spreading. Yeah. Oh, those fucking people are spreading. I'm happy you're here. I'm really happy you're here because there's something I got to show you. Lisa, I, had, I called Lisa I today. I haven't seen this in years. You know, listen. I came from Cuba. All I ever wanted to be was a dirty white person. That's all I ever wanted out of life. When I was about 13, I really got a fucking taste of it. My mom put music out in that bar, and I heard this music, and I'm like, wait a second. Morrison was dirty? But that poetry shit didn't make him that dirty. Mm -hmm. That poetry shit pulled him out. Like, the end is strong. But when I heard the Allman Brothers, Felicia, something about them that makes me go ape shit. Like, especially, so, put some months for Felicia, put on... Allman Brothers live from the Fillmore East, 929-1970, Whipping Post. Okay, that's going to have to... Just put Whipping Post live from the Fillmore East. 
I want Felicia to see this. What? By the way, I saw this in, uh, with my st- I was in Kansas with my uh, family over Easter, and my stepmother was watching PBS, but she was watching a documentary about the sound studios in Muscle Shoals. Oh, shit. All it's on about Netflix. Y- y- oh. It's such an amazing documentary. No, that's badass. Who went there and shit? Yeah. Did you watch yeah. Vinyl last night? I did, When yes. he went to talk to Elvis? Oh, yeah. And yes. he's like, what, we go to Muscle Shoals? Oh, yeah. I was and Elvis like, yes. was fucking foaming at the fucking mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, let me blow my nose. I'm yeah, sorry. It, Lee, if you get a chance to watch this documentary, it was so amazing, and, they, and it was about how Dwayne Allman came down, and then he brought his brothers, but all the people that recorded the first one on top in yeah. those studios, it's amazing. Skinner, the Stones, the, the Stones, Stones were big all Aretha Franklin, all the people. Look at these two savages, and then we're gonna fast forward this. You know, people talk about singers. Anybody could go up there and sing. But to lay your soul down, two different worlds. Hit it, Lisa. Want to start from the beginning? Just in the beginning. We'll fast forward it. Watch these savages. See, these guys didn't know. They weren't thinking about Trump. They weren't (laughs) thinking about Republicans. They weren't thinking about black people. This band, they were just thinking of being white brilliance. This is all this is. This is white brilliance. Listen to that guy's voice, though. Look at that boy's face. Yeah. Are you yeah. fucking... Fuck Brad Pitt. <laughs> fuck Dan Michael Vincent. <laughs> fuck Sons of Anarchy. Look at his eyes. What the fuck you think is on his mind? Oh, oh. Are you fucking kidding me for this shit? I know, it's pretty amazing. So awesome. What do you think he's thinking about? He's like, I'm not going <laughs> to fuck up. That's what he's thinking. <laughs> Look at him. That's white brilliance, Felicia. Yeah. These guys are from some dirty town in Florida or Jacksonville or one of those places that. Look at him. Look. This guy don't know. Nobody sent him. A, he don't even care about the memo. Yeah. <laughs> he don't have time to fuck with the memo. Do they have two drummers? I think they do, right? Yeah, they have two drummers. I like the black one. Listen, <laughs> ask, ask the Almond Brothers who they like, and they'll go. He, he's not. He doesn't have a color. They didn't think that way. These guys thought about the soul of the music. That's right. That's why in the Listen documentary. That was a, really one of the first times in those studios where blacks and whites worked together. And guys. they were talking about, in Muscle Shoals, how they would come out of the studios and there'd be white guys and black guys and everyone would stare at them just hanging out because they had the connection of music. And how when Dwayne Allman came, he was the first guy that had the long hair. And then people really were like, who the fuck, fuck, fuck is that? You know? They didn't look at color, though. Yeah. They looked at... They didn't even see color, these guys. They grew up in fucking We Hate Brothersville. Look at this guy. How many joints do you think he smoked today? This shit this morning had me sweat, Felicia. Yeah. Pouring out of my armpits. My sides were sweating. I was drinking coffee. I was banging that fucking pipe outside. I watched this whole thing. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> look at him, look at him. Effortlessly. Look how cool he is.
Now, I think that guy's Dickie Betts. That's the crazy guy that they all talk about. The one in the middle? Yeah. The guitar player? Or is he a bass player? The guitar player. The guitar He's player. just as lethal as this fucking savage right here. I've been such a <laughs> Why that really affects you? Oh, this that, is white brilliance. Yeah. This is something that they didn't uh, they didn't walk around with their coffee cups. They didn't care about what you look at them, look at them. Look at them. They didn't care. They cared about the music. This is live. It sounds like and there's I don't know how many fucking people there. That's a big place. These guys were this will never happen again. You don't think? Never again. Yeah. They don't appreciate it. They don't this is something completely different. They were going. They, they, no, no, you think those guys have a costume designer? You think they got yeah. tattoos? <laughs> Did you see any hats? Did you see any of that? Yeah, shit? yeah. They yeah. Really had a, give me the fucking guitar. You, you, yeah. you really want to? Wait, you know what you're getting yourself into by coming here tonight? Yeah. Well, I didn't know. We're gonna rock, and then you're gonna suck. Every you ready? Uh -huh. That's what they did. Look at them. They didn't fucking care. Yeah. They didn't care. Them and Leonard Skinner are the best things that happened. And I always say, if the fucking, they wouldn't have died, it would have been a different game. But these guys, they're fucking, that's too much for me to even watch. That fucking makes me get the car and just drive off a cliff, because I could never get that good. I could never be that free. Really? That's... Even when you're on stage and you're just talking some major shit and you're not even doing your act and you're just free-flowing? That Those guys tapped into something not... I could tap into something, but for you, what you, Lee, and I to tap into something together? Uh huh. That's a completely different ball game. Yeah. At the same time, three right, six right, people right, on right, that right, fucking right, stage right. connecting. Yeah. That's perfectly. That'll never happen again. Led Zeppelin at the Garden. That'll never happen again. UFO, Strange in the Night. That'll never happen again. And you, when you have a great set, is not at that level. Like, well, the best out of your life. Listen, man. I dream to achieve that type of perfection. That's what you dream of. Not one night, but to do that three out of five nights on the road. Alcohol, women, drugs, freedom. That's a big fucking word. And that's what those guys were. They didn't give a fuck. They reached the level. To do that at the Fillmore East, you know, to have all those songs, watch that whole thing. And you'll sit there and go, what the fuck are these guys on? Mm -hmm. I'll do it. I'll do it. What do they got? Give me the exact Chinese powder they're on and who shot it. And what? That's what I want. That's perfection. Do man. you ever have a uh, time in your life where you did sets that were so exceptional to you? That you remember it? Like, for me, I remember living in New York, and I did once a set at Joe's Pub, which was sometimes kind of a hard place to work. And I don't know how it happened, but I had one of the best sets that I'd ever had. And I still think about that night, how it was like lightning struck for me. Do you ever have a, a set like that that you think about? Yeah. Yes. And where was that at? Last year on the road, last year on the road, there would be a couple cities I would go into and I'd have my fucking way to the point where I couldn't believe it. Like there were uh, ice house crowds. Like uh -huh. you weren't doing great. You were manhandling them like for 40 fucking minutes, mm -hmm. you know, like 46 minutes of manhandling them. When we taped the special in Vegas, that special is kaputs because I didn't manhandle them. The room was too big, and my timing was off. I had to do too much time. I felt like I had to drag my material and get my point across. 
it really wasn't my style. I'm not good at shooting fucking specials, man. I'm good at shooting CDs. I'm not mm -hmm. really good at specials for some reason. Why do you think that is? I got like a mental block in my mind. I fucking fold two days before the special. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah, I fold two days before the special. I just cave. It's too much. Yeah. I, I don't know. I always think that... <sighs> Name the three specials that fucking inspired you. Well, for sure, Richard Pryor live on Sunset. Really? Yeah. Why? Uh, because right when I, uh, Jeff Valdez, when I was 19 years old, I lived with him, and my dad came in to Denver, and my dad was a projectionist, and he had to go, his job is when the old equipment uh, was being replaced he would go in and replace the old equipment and, and put the new equipment in and take it with him and he worked at a really old theater where they he replaced the equipment and it was uh, Richard Pryor's Live on Sunset that came on and that changed my life and then I saw about a year ago the documentary about Richard Pryor doing that special and how the first night when he did that right, special he bombed. Bombed. bombed 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 and that was about the time at the Hollywood Bowl where he went up there and oh, did the, yeah, the yeah, gay yeah, thing they yeah, called a bunch yeah, of fags yeah. where were you when I needed you and shit right, like that right right and and uh, and then I mean like his ass must have been sweating he was bombing so hard and then he came back the next night and killed it you know and I can relate as a comic to that you know to uh, and I think that you don't even have to be a comic to relate to that you know something you're doing at your job where you fucked up you know and you know you got it and then you're like I'm gonna fucking do it no matter what and then you go back and you kill it the next night so for that that's one of my top specials that I think changed my life uh, in the beginning and then changed my life uh, a year or two ago when I saw the documentary I think it was a year ago well I took the bus to go see that special you did I took the bus on a Friday night with Sabatino Dominic Special his older brother we had to be 13 14 maybe 15 I guess right mm -hmm. something like that and we took the bus down there and I got my arm cut at the way out they tried to mug us in Jersey City but I remember going to see that special and being happy because he had recovered from the burn mm -hmm. and all that shit. But when he did that joke, I think I almost fell down. And there's many a nights that I've sat there smoking weed, thinking about that night, thinking while I was watching that at that early age in the back of my mind, was I really thinking about stand-up? And I got to look at you and tell you the truth, not at all. I thought it was brilliant. What he had done, mm -hmm. I fucking went home. I had Bicentennial Negra. I had, was it something I said? In fact, today I went to the doctor. And I got on the elevator. There was five chicks, five old bats. Get on the fucking elevator. I get on with them. And they're all stirring me down, right? And I'm sitting in the back. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say a word. I got in the back. And all of a sudden, ping, elevator two. The second floor, the thing opens up. And all five hags walk out. And I look at the one. I go, was it something I said? <laughs> and that's the cover. Uh -huh. one, it was one album with the with the thing on, and there's a bunch of white people. He's got a mask on, or they got hoods on, or something like that. When I heard that, that really impacted me. Yeah, that really. And again, stand up was nowhere close. When I went to see that guy from Boston in '87, uh, stand up was not even on the fucking horizon. Yeah, nothing at all that time. Nothing. I didn't even think about it like that. I didn't start thinking about it seriously till eighty eight. And I mm -hmm. didn't get on stage till ninety one. So that's how long I dragged my fucking feet, you know. But when I think of specials, I think of that one. I think of Andrews special. Who's Can I, Andrews. The first one's from Philadelphia, Andrew Dice Clan. Uh -huh. I think of Eddie Murphy's Delirious. And two nights before I'm doing my special I care because in the back of my mind they'll never be that good. That's what I want. I want that type of perfection that it happens once in a lifetime, but it lives forever. You know, and yeah. I, and I, in the back of my mind, I cave, even though I go on, I'll go on the road four weeks and polish shit and cut shit out and uh -huh. really tune up the energy because that I gotta come out. Once I come out energy high, I got them. But I gotta come out in the first round like Rocky Balboa. I can't piss around and make believe I'm Seinfeld. Once I think I'm Seinfeld, 
it's over. I'm so surprised to hear that. Yeah. yeah. You help me a lot because you told me once you are what you are. People come see you, come see that type of shit, that nonsense. And I, I understood it. I go, she's right. There's people I could listen to and there's people I could not listen to. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way life is, you know. Well, conversely, when I started at the comedy store, Richard Pryor would come in and he would come in on a Tuesday night and he would do a set. And, you know, uh, that special changed my life. But then you fast forward 10 years later or whatever, and probably not 10, like five years later, and he would come in to the original room, go up at 830 on a Tuesday night and he would be so fucking terrible and you as a young comic you'd be sitting there going what the fuck man this is supposed to be the great prior but you're young you don't know and then you would see him come in every night and then they like, come in Wednesday and maybe one joke would work and by Friday night it would be like fucking butter you know what I mean it would be so amazing you're like this is the fucking great prior and he would be killing it and that was a big lesson to me as a comedian that to see someone who i revered so much <clears throat> to eat the biggest shit and not care not care Chappelle does that i saw Chappelle do that the other night you have to do that you have to do you that. have to do that yeah. that's the tightrope yeah. that's the tightrope that's the discipline that's it until you can do that nothing really moves forward that's why what really helped me was 98 at the store I got involved in something up there that was a sort of storytelling. And that gives you patience. When you sort of storytell, you got to be up there for a minute or two weaving them. So you got to become interesting. And that taught me the patience. Lee, hit it. Let's do some shout outs here. Felicia's going to go do a set and shit. You're sitting there all fucking stoned. I'm happy you came by and shit. Well, thank you for having That's me. That's right, you bad motherfucker. I oh, know. It's interesting. <laughs> God damn, I've missed you, Joey. <laughs> So I'm going to go pick up the steroids tomorrow. i got to go on a four-week steroid plan to reduce the swelling in my nose. Yeah, what's going on with that? It's gone. It's just I had to answer a questionnaire, and if you get like four out of fucking seven, that's it. So for four weeks, I go on a steroid thing, uh -huh. reduces the swelling. i got to be off this by Friday. Yeah, that stuff is no good if this you get no addicted good. to it, right? Yeah, now it's not even working no more. So yeah. now you pass and do I'm going to have a hard time working out because when I can't breathe, I get anxiety. So you're allowed to put one spray in the morning on one nostril and one spray in the other one every 12 hours. And then you got to just go wean yourself off and just toughen it up for the weekend like this. Mm -hmm. I used to have an uncle and a cousin who was addicted to that nose spray. And they would keep it in their little pocket. Oh, my God. And they would, they would speaking of a guy with a mirror always doing that, oh right, God. with a spoon, they would be every, like, five to ten minutes, they'd do a snort, snort. No, I got <laughs> The last couple weeks, ten days, I've been blasting one or two, and I got it. I got to blow my nose and then put my head back and let it go in there. And I've been sleeping at night, so hopefully they're going to put a balloon in there in four weeks. You know what I'm saying? Lee, you were right over there. That little 200 package fucking kill you. Yeah, it was Let me good. Give some shout outs here, my man. Chris <laughs> Penny, Bob Lingus, hoping your dad's good. Joey Brooklyn, looking good. Hayden Herbert, Kyle Uber, Travis Anderson, Rad Jazz, and my man Jesse Wright. If you motherfuckers in the San Francisco. Oakland, Bay Area this weekend. Felicia Michaels is working at the... I'm going to actually be in Reno at the... Reno! Silver, Reno at the Silver Legacy. Silver Legacy, but it's the factory in the Silver the Legacy. No, but people will drive Legacy. on the weekends Sometimes from the Bay Area. Do, yeah. No, yeah. they do, they do, they will. They have nothing going on. They'll say, you know what, fuck it, let's take a ride to Reno, get fucked up, watch Felicia Michaels, fucking blow the stage up up in Reno. Shit, that's a good little place. Have yeah, I there? can't wait. I've have never been, been there. there uh-uh, not I to that room. I used to go up there when there was a Catch a Rising Star. Now, are Catch a Rising Stars, are they done? I don't know. Uh, I think there's one in Jersey still, isn't it? Check it out, Lisa. I am banned from there. 
Are you really? Would Me you... and the kid from Philly, the kid that does the signs for the improv. Shh, hey, you, don't talk. And he's from Philly. You ever, go, you ever go to any of the improvs in the beginning of the show? A guy comes out, I know you're here. Uh, you came down to watch comedy, but your cell phone. Talk, right, shut up. Right. Talk, what's his name? I don't I have no Todd idea. Todd Glass. Todd Glass. Todd okay. Glass is from Philadelphia, and me and him are the only two comedians banned from the whole Catch a Rising <laughs> Star chain. <laughs> what did you do to get banned? I was working the week, and there was a snowstorm. And at 5.30, they called me, and they go, hey, we're canceling the show. Then at 7.30, it died snow, and they called me back, and they go, we got a show, and I was in the city. So I said, guys, I'm in the fucking city. I'll never make it. You guys could do this to me. There's a snowstorm. There's traffic. So I didn't show up. They gave me my check and shit, but then they just said he's fired. He's wow. I was always working Reno. Reno was good. Yeah. Reno was a fun place because the machines were fucking broken, so you'd always hit the jackpot for eleven hundred. But then the clinker is, the guy that ran the fucking club was tight with the the floor manager, so on Saturday they let you go in the booth, and they would run the money for like ten minutes and you could catch money. Oh. <laughs> You gotta do what you gotta do, That's though. That's right. We got a cocaine problem, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Every ten dollar counts. Soon as you in the old days, soon as you checked in, they gave you an envelope. Mm -hmm. Soon as you came in, they gave you an envelope, a uh, coupons for the Chinese noodle bar and the buffet. Not mm -hmm. bad. I went yeah. there with what's the guy that died? The Vietnam vet, Cuban, Vince from the comedy store, got diabetes. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, the Asian wife, nice guy, did the CDs for everybody. He no did good. the week with me. I did it with Schubert one week. I was doing it a lot. And uh -huh. then they fucking banned me. But I was up there twice a year up there at the Silver yeah. Legacy. I would hit the jackpot for 900 And then I would get three, four, five, six hundred in the fucking thing. And they gave you a measly 75 as check. You know, it didn't do yeah. nothing for you. But who gave the fuck? Just the little things you made, though. And the guy was cool because... The assistant to the assistant to the assistant to the assistant manager at the club <laughs> was also the manager at the recording studio. So he would steal the dupes. Uh huh. Who does that shit? It was oh, what, this is when the improv was there. No, this is when Catch was there. Yeah. There was a kid that was a manager at the comedy club. But uh -huh. In the daytime, he worked at the recording studio. And bands would go up there and they record, and he would put an extra tape recorder on. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Then he would pull them out and give them to you as a gift. So when Aerosmith was up there rehearsing, he taped all the fucking rehearsals, shit like that. Right. He was just a dynamite kid. He paid you on Friday instead of Saturday, and you got your check cashed. Right. He was just one of those guys. And again, that you think about and go, wow, where is he? You know? Mm -hmm. Like that. That's it. That's. Lee, you're 26. You're going to make a thousand friends. And you're going to lose a thousand friends. And you're going to sit there and go, what the fuck happened? And now, thank God, Facebook. Thank God you have Facebook now. Because now there's a slight connection to these people. If Felicia Michael gets bored one night, she goes, what happened to that open mic or an 88? You could press her name in and she'll come up on Facebook or not. And all of a sudden you'll realize they live in some town in Tampa, Florida. Mm. And she's got three kids or something. That's the power of Facebook. That's what Facebook, you know, 10 years ago it was classmates.com. Classmates.com <laughs> is dead and buried. Fuck you. You know what I'm saying? Class Fuck you. I yeah. don't even remember classmates.com. <laughs> yeah, class, they're still around lurking, trying to get a 20 from you, though, peak. Remember your first crush in high school? Give us 9 yeah. and we'll see. You give, I gave him like 20 yeah. bucks. Nothing ever happened. Nobody fucking registers for class. Only geeks. Hang out for mm -hmm. the fucking killers. They don't, you know, Karnak Asadorian, the Charlie <laughs> Gizzy. He's not going to set it at classmate.com. Classmates. I think it still exists. Yeah. I have like a, <laughs> fuck yeah, classmates.com. But ain't nobody giving them nine ninety five. They got Facebook now. Who gives a fuck? What is it? How much is it to join? Let me look and find out. This is the first time they've even had advertising in 10 <laughs> fucking know, years. I'm giving them free fucking Classmate advertising. They're done. I forgot all about yeah, that. Yeah, they've been lurking on Facebook. You pop up from time to time. Hey, you want to bump into Mildred? You know what? And pay you? I'm on Facebook talking to Mildred's brother right now. I got to give you nine ninety five to join and fucking see pictures from high school. Has there ever been an experience where you've bumped into somebody and you were like, step back and sneak away? Bump into them from what era? Any era.
a lot of people show up to shows now. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. It really... I think about them. I think about our interaction, like when they hit me on Facebook or they surprise me and I'm and I go, Hold on, hold on, great to see you. Let me go take pictures. Well I'm taking pictures with people, I'm thinking about our history. Like, why is he here? You know. And sometimes I'm really happy to see people. But sometimes I don't know. It's kinda weird. Like they I don't like how they show up. You know, especially when I go to Florida. When I go to Florida, they come out of the woodwork. And there's people that are really dynamite that I see that come up, give me a hug, and they're like, we got to go, bro. And I'm like, Phew. Yeah, yeah. But then there's people that want to lurk. There's one guy, Louis Jerez, old school North Bergen guy, comes up to the show, pays for his own ticket. And on the way out, I'll see him out of the corner of my eye, and he'll go, yo. And I'll see him, and he'll come over, give me a hug, and he'll just disappear. Because he understands the situation, what's going on and stuff. But nine out of ten times, Felicia, fuck yeah, I'm happy to see somebody. Mm -hmm. Fuck yeah. And there's people that I want to see that haven't popped their head up. That's what really kills me. Like, I did a lot of things with them. You know what I'm saying? It's easy to get a hold of me now. I'm a fucking, I'm on all this shit, mm -hmm. you know? But anybody from those days, yeah, I like to have a conversation with them. From that rap pack that I hung out with that we were kind of crazy, I don't talk to Stinky anymore. <laughs> but I talk to his brother. I talk to his brother like once a month. We're still tight. And he sends messages. And at the end of the conversation, he always apologizes for his brother not talking to me. And him and I don't talk because he told me as a man, he goes, listen, I'm really proud of you, what you did, man, but... I, I can't talk to you. I mean, he said it to my face, Felicia. Oh, really? On the phone. Really? Nobody's ever done something like that. But why did he not want to talk to you? This was after... Uh, <clears throat> you know why, Felicia? Because as much as we loved each other, every time we'd see each other, it was never nothing good. And I came a pussy hair from ruining his life. We both could have got arrested for robbing a jewelry store with Marblehead. And we both would have done 10 fucking years, all three of us. And I think that sometimes he thinks about that. And he goes, what the fuck? Every time I was with this fucking dude. Every, I mean, Felicia, every time. We had a good time. But he wasn't an innocent. But in some people's mind, Felicia, like my buddy Avillo told me one time that he actually hooked up with Fernie. And that during the conversation, Fernie said, you know what, I'm going to tell you something? My mom's really mad at you. And he goes, what are you talking about? And she goes, my mom's really mad at you because of all the parties you had growing up. My mom always thought that the problems I got into was because of you. That's a weird fucking angle to have on life, that mm -hmm. you used to have a lot of parties, so I became fucked up because of your parties. But I didn't talk to Stinky from 93, and then I probably called him in 2001. I was in Jersey, and I was driving, and I got his number from a friend of mine. I called him up. He answered the phone. We talked for like 15 minutes. And then he said, listen, man, my life has changed now. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> I got a kid. I'm a born-again Christian. I, uh, I don't drink. Uh. I don't do this no more. I don't do that no more. I just work. And he had gotten money. He had gotten a stock buyout. Like mm -hmm. he started at UPS and they used to pay. So he started at UPS in 82, dog. That's the only job he's ever had since high school. He started at UPS in 81. How many years is that? Late 1916. That's a lot. 35. 35, 35 years. He's been at UPS since he was a senior in high school. Wow. So like in 2000, they did a stock buyout. And he got like $3 million. He stopped talking. Are you serious? Stopped talking to his brother for a few years uh -huh. because of the dough. Stopped talking to a few of his friends. So when I called him, he was still on the, don't even think of me, like on that defense. Uh -huh. You follow me? And I said to him, you know, it's good to talk to you. You know, I always loved you. And he goes, I love you too. He goes, but listen, here's the, the, tr the truth. I changed my life, blah, 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 blah. He goes, so I appreciate if you lose my number. And I didn't say fuck off or nothing. I go, you know what? Thank you for the honesty. Thank you for always being there for me when I was a kid. I understand. 
I didn't shed a tear because at least he told me. Told you. Oh, because when people was, don't tell yeah, you, that's he worse. Was, yeah. He said it right out. Yeah. I was like, you know what, man? And I thought about it. I broke it down. I never did nothing bad to him. In fact, we made dough together. But thinking back, I took him down some dark streets that he could have got out of. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. There's no victims in my fucking... There's no victims here. Yeah. He could have said plenty of times, dog, this ain't for me. And guess what? The type of guy I am, I would have still taste, gave him a taste because I loved him as a brother. Mm -hmm. We were together for a long time. We did a lot of shit together. There was a time, you know, Felicia, I was telling Lee tonight, I used to buy a thousand black beauties for $40. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. You know what that's like? <laughs> yeah. You know how many friends you have? <laughs> A thousand. Because 40, <laughs> a thousand <laughs> divided by 40, uh -huh. that's nothing. That's pennies a piece. Not even. Not even. So if you bought 10 hits of mescaline for me, I'd throw in 10 fucking black beauties and you go, oh my God, you're the best. No. Cost me fucking 10 cents. I used to make so much money on those black beauties. He had a girlfriend that used to do them. And I used to give him a cut. Just because he'd sell them. Like, I'd give him like 50 bucks a week when he was a sophomore. In his world... 50 bucks was he could go to clubs. You know, when you were 16 in those days, you went out at night. I would give him a cut. He would call me up and I'd say, listen, I sold this this week. Take a cut. Oh, yeah, yeah, I told this guy to buy ups from me. Just because he was helping me out a little bit. I always took care of him. And when we were robbing, whether he held the gun or not, <laughs> I gave him a taste. You know me. I always gave him a taste. He's my brother. He's got the car. You know, <laughs> was it a bigger taste if he had a gun? The more action you do, you, know, <laughs> you show up with the eyeball, you get more action. If you show up and go listen in that building on the third floor, there's a guy who's got a million dollars up there. What I'm going to do is this, Joey. I'm going to catapult up to the third floor. I got a fucking chain like Spider-Man. I'm going to pull myself up, go in. All I want you to do is get more with a walkie-talkie. I expect 300 Gs. For a walkie-talkie? Why not? Why not? That's an working walkie -talkie. it, walkie talkie. Working it like a professional. How do you work walkie talkie? You were out here with your dog, you know, with a, with they can see your face if the cops pass by. I'm on the corner watching deep. I got a fucking CB radio in my ear with the cop fucking thing. So if somebody calls and says we see a little Jew bald guy going across on a fucking catapult, you understand <laughs> me? I got the 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 fucking police radio in my fucking ear. That's a CB guy. I'll give you like You're 100,000. Maybe no, 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 no. You got to give me 300 large. <laughs> 300 to third. 100,000 for the job and 200 to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, well, that's... No. Mm. Right or wrong? Right or wrong? You want me to go tell him some... See, if you give me 100 grand, I'm going to go home and think about it and say, he's a greedy motherfucker. What if I tell my friends, Lee has $900,000 in his apartment right now. You're going to last 15 fucking minutes. <laughs> If I put it out there on the police walkie-talkie, you'll last 15 minutes. Those gorillas will kick your fucking door down and throw you off the balcony. For How would you thousand. get the word out back then? Oh, my God. Just go to the bar and sit there and get a drink and go, Whew, Lee's got 900000 in his apartment. Can you believe that? <laughs> Suddenly there's no one in the bar but you. And people will look at each other and go, what are you talking about? Fucking Lee and me robbed that joint. Fucking Jew bastard gave me a hundred fucking grand. He got a million cash, nine hundred thousand. That's it. You sure? Yeah. Where's he got the money? Well, we just robbed him ten minutes ago. This has got to be in his house. You're dead. You're <laughs> dead. <laughs> what people will do for nine hundred thousand yeah, cash? Yeah. You're dead. Don't march right in there with man. They don't care about cameras. Nothing. They'll kick the door down, put a gun in your mouth. Go. Where's the money? You'll you'll be negotiating. I'll give you two hundred thousand. Boom. That's it, it's over. They'll just take the fucking money. You might as well just give it to them. Joey put the word on. But you give me 300000 it's 100 to keep my mouth shut, another 100 to forget. Remember that thing we did? What thing? I don't know what you're talking about. That's it. Those are expensive thoughts to forget. Jesus. 700000 you're going to clear for fucking being Bingo the Clown for 10 minutes. Who are you kidding? <laughs> Who do you think's out there working the walkie-talkie like a savage? What if I just cut the fucking rope? And call the cops on you. You're my competition. You fall off, I go up there and take the mill. You ever think about that? No, you didn't. So this is why you pay the small 3% and everybody's happy. You go to an island, I never see you again. It's not the small 3%, it's the small 33%. What was the movie with Sean Penn? He did with his wife in the late 80s. 
he was in the Irish mob and he didn't like what he was seeing so how he got out was he 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 staged the, with John Turturro really good yeah, fucking what movie. Was that movie he staged the fake hit and he uh -huh. disappeared to Boston and became a cop then the guys with Gary Oldham Ooh, yeah what was that movie Ooh, and Ed Harris and fucking the, the blonde and the Robin oh, Wright. Oh, oh, you know who else in that movie? State of Grace. State of Grace. State you know, of you know Grace. who else in that movie? Burgess Meredith. Oh, yeah? Remember they kick his door down. He's like, I don't know nothing. I'm just eating fucking beans out of a can. I'm an old man. I don't see nothing. He's in that fucking movie. But that was the plot with Sean Penn, that he had done something. So that rep that was still out there. Mm -hmm. So when he went back, that's the first thing that Harris made him do. He goes, a couple of years ago, you shot a guy up in the Bronx. You got to go up there and shoot him up because he knows. He gets pinched for something. He's going to come back. Where else? Oh, I was watching something else. But the other yeah, day I was watching something with it. Anyway, who gives a fuck? Did you ever see Sicario? Yes, I did. That was a fucking awesome movie. She was very good. She was great in it. She was very Benicio good. Benicio was amazing in it. And the other guy was good. I always liked him. He's mm -hmm. really good. He used to be married to that chick, hot-looking guy, older now, with the flip-flops on throughout the movie. Oh, uh, 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 yes, Brolin, he, James he Brolin. He was an American gangster yeah, as the yeah. cop. It's fucking great. good, dog. Lee, what's going on with you? Speaking of the movies, I went to the drive-in this weekend. It was so much fun. What was the name you of the did? place? Yeah, I went to the one you were talking about. It's like uh, the the Vineland Pacific Theater or something. But the, it's actually cool. Pacific Theater seems to have like a, a bunch of small theaters, but it was all, it couldn't have been more fun. It's like an hour away in like a crappy neighborhood or something like City of Industry. It's right by the train tracks, which kind of, is like the one downside. But it was cool. Like they had. It built like kind of like a, uh, a ski slalom, so we, you could park the car, tilt it up, and we had a clear shot of the uh, screen. Yeah. So on two movies, we had snacks, we had all the food in our. We didn't leave the car once. It was great. You could yeah, you, you had your own car. No one was talking. You could be on your phone if you want to. Paula, it it kind of, like if Paula wants to talk during the movie, she can talk and it won't. It's not going like, to ruin the theaters. It was, it was pretty amazing. When I was growing up, my dad owned a drive-in movie theater in no Stockton, way. California. And it had the biggest screen in Northern California. And he lived on a... This is so white trash. He lived on a trailer at the back of the lot. And he had a picture window in his trailer. <laughs> and so you'd be eating dinner. And you would see, like, Orca crashing into the pier. You know what I mean? And our job growing up... Uh, mostly my brother's job was to go and pick up all the garbage and sometimes you'd find a lot of money but mostly shitty diapers <laughs> it was like the worst job ever it was so terrible you went to the drive now, that's so... the, the funny thing is every time you do a gig you've seen that drive in theater mm -hmm. somebody brought it to my attention somebody went down a date like 10 years ago and she told me she goes I went down a date on a theater it was great yeah, you What's did? the name of the place? It's on the five. No, you and it's close uh -huh. to here. It's fucking 20 minutes. If no. You, or it turns into an hour because there's traffic. No, it's a while away. It, really? It, it, I don't, it wasn't really even on the five. We took the 10 a little bit down. We took like the 210 to the 10 sort of way. Um, but it was great. The only, just, you have to go and go see a movie that's probably not like super serious because the sound isn't great. Like I had to play with my stereo to get it perfect. But it was. It was nine bucks each, and we, we it, it was amazing. It could have been more fun. When uh, my first experience at a movie was when I was really little. My parents went to a drive-in theater, and it was to go see the Yellow Submarine, uh, the Beatles' Yellow Submarine. And I have this memory of being like two years old, standing up in the back seat, and watching the movie and going, "What the fuck is going on?" <laughs> It was so such a crazy movie. Like I couldn't understand. It's like I should understand this. It's a cartoon. I saw that movie yeah. as a child. I didn't know what the fuck. I was know, going. right? I didn't get movies till I went to see Herbie the Love Bug, and then I got a little enthused about it. And then I saw like the uh, the strongest man in the world, whatever, with Jam Michael Vincent. It was mm -hmm. a Disney movie. And then after that, I just dove into it. I went to see a James Bond movie. And I never went back to the mm -hmm. kid movies. Like all that shit was bullshit, Snoopy. Right. Once I saw Her Majesty's Secret Service, I lost it. And then my godfather took me to see, like, either Death Wish or Stone Killer. And I really lost it. Like, I, that was it. I wasn't going back to Disney bullshit. Mm -hmm. 
then I just got worse and worse. Like, I went to see The Exorcist in the movie theater. That makes it 10 years fucking old. That's not good. Yeah. That's not bueno. But in yeah. those days, they didn't give a fuck. They didn't care. There was no PTSD, you know. You should have PTSD after watching The Exorcist. When you're 10. The <laughs> yeah. There was another movie that had come out about two years after The Exorcist. Maybe about a year after The Exorcist. And what they did was they tried to outdo The Exorcist. And they gave you a puke bag. Oh. And it was like the Satan's tongue or something. something. Oh, really? And they ripped out, that was it. They ripped out somebody's tongue in the movie or something. But then Midnight Express did it, and it was fine then by that time. They don't even edit that on ABC. Well, they don't show it on ABC, but I remember when Midnight Express was on ABC, and they didn't edit that part. Wow. You know what was on tonight, Lee? What was you on? never discussed it with me. You never told me what you thought. I am not big on superhero movies. Okay. I have never been big on superhero movies, but right. it was on tonight. And I had peace, and I watched it for an hour. And I got to tell you something, I cried. That's why I love The Crow so much. Oh, okay. That is why The Crow, listen, I'm a sucker for a romantic movie, but not the good-looking dude with Sandra Bullock. Like, that's <laughs> not a romantic movie to me at all. Rocky Balboa in the first Rocky, that's as romantic as it gets. He fell in love with a woman, changed her fucking... Every time I see that movie, it changes me more. The other night I was watching it, before he goes to the arena and the shorts and it doesn't really matter and he goes back and he's breaking down and she puts them together. They did that on one take. That retard that walks around that people make fun of and shit. And I watched Creed on the plane. It wasn't an Academy Award winner. The, the Crow? The fucking black kid wasn't bad in Creed. Oh, no, no, no. He was really good. That's a fucking good actor. That's a good looking dude, dog. That yeah, dude's gonna cause some damage. That's gonna be a really good guy. He, he shouldn't have won an Oscar, so black no. people shouldn't be pissed about that. Rocky. You know why he didn't win? Because to people like that, he's a joke. But in my world, he's a hundred billion dollar joke. Because he's he's laughing all the way to the fucking bank with mm -hmm. that goddamn movie. I saw that. I saw Creed. I had a great time. I, I don't care what anyone he says. fucking wrote Rocky. Like, Rocky's not a script. There's so many little intricacies in Rocky that you look at and go, that Momo wrote this, like, he felt this during the... Like, he explained this to the director. Like, this is what I really feel in this scene. Let's do it. Just for him doing that, I've always given him the respect that man fucking deserves. Should he have gotten an Oscar? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. They got me all fucking confused, Felicia. <laughs> but yeah, the quote was... It, it was interesting. It was very... You didn't like it. No, like no, it's no. Not, no, no, no. Tell me what you really fucking thought. I don't want you to... It's not a great movie. I I thought it was interesting because it's like a very 90s movie. Just like with the tones and like the lighting and the, and the especially like the, like, the, like the synthesizer music in it. But it was... I, I like... I think I like it because like when you're in love you see stuff and like that when movies and stuff. It was a good movie... But it wasn't, it never really took me anywhere. It was just, it was fun watching. I was never really scared or, or I didn't really know what to feel. It was just. Listen, in my world, how good was the pussy that you came back from the dead to Avenger? Yeah. <laughs> I thought the little okay, girl was really good. He fucking loved that woman with all his heart. And just to think that a man could love a woman that much, how sad he was. He came back to Avenger and he fucking killed it everybody he scared the kid the, the kid's mom yeah that was good when he took the heroin out of her fucking arms when he kills that dude uh luther from 48 hours and all that shit james patrick i did that movie with him the longest yard dynamite guy i loved that because the guy kept saying there ain't no coming back there ain't no coming back there ain't no coming back. And he taped them up. He put a grenade in his fucking pocket. No, that's a tremendous scene. He loved that woman that fucking much. He took the other guy, put him in the fucking tub, and chopped him up. Tremendous. Nobody does this type of shit no more. You know what I'm saying? Like, you really got to love it. He dug himself out of the grave. He had the makeup, the music. He had good actors in the movie. There was some fucked up dark shit in the movie. And then to top it all off, he gets killed. He gets shot during that movie. Yeah. With a fucking gun from the set. Not one charge was ever fucking... Oh, he was charged? Oh, really? Nobody ever got charged. Nobody ever yeah. went to jail for that. I think, I think, man, in the movie he got charged. So what happened? No, he got shot he while he was shot. shooting that movie. That's what 
that's what you didn't know. I'm trying to fucking. Was it because it was a fake uh, a round, fake gun. but it just weirdly. It had a ground in it. And it had like a, a thing that had metal. So it went off like a bullet, I guess. I don't mm-hmm. remember the whole story. But nobody, nobody ever got like this guy died mysteriously. He got shot during that fucking movie. So did someone have to else finish the role? They or? used his face. You don't even see it. It was like three or four or five scenes or something like that. It was just the weirdest fucking thing. You know, so 20, 30 years earlier, this happened with his father. It was an accidental death. He went to some woman's house, took aspirins, he passed out, and he fucking went into a coma and died. And now this kid dies on the set of this fucking movie. It was just, you know... And it wasn't a bad movie. You know, I watch it and I get amused. I've seen worse shit. It's not, you know, it's not... And I really like the little girl. I thought the little girl was very funny. Um... But do you have you seen it, Felicia? Um, I saw it a long time ago, but I was just thinking about you know, don't you uh, love when you get tricked into a movie and you think, oh, it's going to be the biggest piece of shit, and it kind of is. But then you it, you identify with it, and for me, and I'm excited to tell you that part two is coming out. Did you ever see the movie John Wick with Keanu Reeves? I fucking love that movie. I really love that movie. Did Did you like that movie? I loved him in that movie. Yeah. I'm a Keanu Reeves freak. Well, me too, dude. And you can go to Duke's any morning, and there he is eating breakfast. <clears> right <throat> on sunset next to Whiskey a go go I used to go there, eat breakfast. You're coming every morning, sit at the counter. You eat your breakfast, go next door, get some weed at the weed store. That weed store is still fucking there. On sunset across from the penthouse store, where the penthouse mm-hmm. store used to be. That Duke's. Yeah. He's in there every morning eating breakfast with a beard, long hair. You don't even know he's him unless you look at him. I've always been a fan of that dude. That movie puts me over the top. Yeah. The shit he did in that movie. Yeah. Now, in the second movie, they just shot it, and Hegan Machado, who was on the podcast, was in Mm -hmm. that movie. He plays the cab driver because he did all the fucking uh, fight scenes for the Uh movie. He helped. John Wick, the people who did that movie, have a studio in Culver City. And all they do is stuntmen who do all that shit all day. And they do all the stunts for movies. They go out with the big movies. Like, these guys don't fuck around. So Did you also see that movie where he was in where they uh, he plays Death? Or he, uh, and Tilda Swinton is in it. And she plays, like, the Angel Michael. Or uh, uh, they made a show, a TV show from it. Oh, I hate that I can't uh, think of the name. But I like that movie, too. The Devil's Advocate is badass. The one with the fucking... Uh, the bank robber with the dude who died from cancer. God rest his soul. It was tremendous. They just did a remake. <laughs> but the one he did about the bank robbers that would dress up like fucking the president. Oh, president. Oh, uh, Patrick Swayze. Yes. yes. Uh, point Break. Tremendous. Point for that I was love an amazing fucking, movie. I love yeah. fucking yeah. John Wick and whatever the fuck his name is. Keanu Reeves, yeah. Listen, man. I'm really happy you fucking stopped. I know. By. Thanks for having me come by, Joey. I always loved you. I was never really mad at you. I always loved you. Yeah. And I always thought we would talk. It would just take time. Yeah. We did and everything worked out. I still love you. You're still the fucking well, prettiest you. thing I have my eyes on and shit. Well, thank you for saying that. No, I'm so glad that uh, we made up. And by the way, you and your friend are going to make up. Maybe Sometimes in friendship, you just take a break, you know? Because things are going down for different people. Yeah, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. But it just... Yeah, it was nice to hear that things could could change. But just just, just go back for one second about uh, The Crow. Like, <laughs> no, because like Joey had me watch it, and I was like, th- when I was watching it, I was thinking... How could like, Joey like this? No, no, no. I was thinking of, like, why Joey likes it. And it was like, what, were, you, like were you thinking about your mother? Or, like, I was just trying to think of, like, like his I liked pain. it for two reasons. I liked it, one, that at that time... I think that movie came out in 93. Four. 94. And I was very upset about divorce. I was very, very upset with myself. And I was very upset with myself in the sense that I didn't try to save the marriage. That where I came from, you always try to save the marriage. You put everything on hold. Where I came from, the school of thought I came from early on, the drugs and life and media and everything else corrupted it. And at that time, I was going through a thing that I was beating myself up. Because the reason why that happened was because I didn't really love her. Mm-hmm. You follow me? And I was a fucking, I was beating myself up in the sense that, I, I, 
you know, how can you not love somebody? So when I went to see that movie, it made me feel bad because here I am, uh, 31 years old, and I never loved a woman. Like, he loved that fucking woman. Mm-hmm. Like, to come back out of a fucking grave to kill somebody. Just, even if it's bullshit. Right, Just right. that thought. That but just, you identify with something yes, like that. just that thought that you could love somebody that fucking much. To that you can't, your soul cannot fucking rest till you come out and hang those four motherfuckers. Just that thought. And then it's got my favorite thing. Revenge. Somebody who they fucking did something wrong to, he goes home, he has a roast beef sandwich. And he shows up and says, remember me? Because mm-hmm. that's what it's all about. At one time, they're having a meeting, and it's creepy. He was fucking his sister, the dude with the sword, and all that dude. He's a great actor. I just saw him this morning on Miami Vice. I swear to God, that same fucking actor from The Crow with the weird face, he was fucking the Asian sister. Oh, yeah. The black dude was in the office, and they're beating up on that mobster dude that's in all the movies at the porn shop. He's really fucking gay. Great guy. I love that guy. He plays a tough guy in all those movies. That guy, they're beating up on him, and that's what they're trying to figure out. Who this guy is. Go see Eric Draven's grave. And when he goes to see the grave, he sees he's missing. And they're fucking wrapped their head about that. But that's the two things. A, that somebody could love somebody that much. I couldn't wrap my head around that. And B, the revenge angle. That he plotted all of them. He set them all up. He took his time. You're going back to Man on Fire. He took his time. He saw their weaknesses, and he nailed them. He just nailed them one at a fucking time, and they couldn't believe it was him. They could not believe it was him. That's what I really... And it all goes back to that Clint Eastwood movie when he disappears and he builds the shield because he knows they're going to shoot at his heart. And he comes out, and the guy keeps shooting at his heart, and he keeps falling down and getting up. And finally, after the third shot, he loses his fucking mind, and Clint Eastwood blasts him. He sucked him into his world. You follow me? But he took his time slow, methodically. I think you should go see Deadpool. That's kind of what the movie's about. I think you'd really like it. Right. Not they, knowing... they throw him in acid and fuck him up, and he puts a superhero costume. Uh, it's not acid. He, he, had, he has cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you fucking spoil it for everybody has got cancer? It's not a spoiler alert. What the fuck it's is the, wrong with you? It's the beginning of the movie. Well, I think that's why I like John Wick so much, and I know it's a stupid movie, but I really love the idea of that how fucked up and he was this killer and that he met this woman and that his love for her was so strong he put his whole bullshit past behind him and then she dies and then sends him a puppy from the grave. That's what gets me. And then some asshole kills, kills the, the puppy. puppy. He was more pissed about that fucking puppy, <laughs> I which I related to. <laughs> yeah, that's, See, that's th- what got me. By three quarters of the movie, he's killed 18 Russians, and you're sitting there going, no, wait a second. At the end of the day, all this is because of a fucking puppy. Yeah. And I get that. Yeah. Like, I fucking get that, too. Like, uh-huh. yeah, you got it. That's it. They killed your fucking puppy. What are you fucking nuts? Yeah. What are you fucking nuts? <laughs> The whole Russian mob has to come down. Oh, yeah, yeah. He kills fucking <laughs> everybody. Puppy. That fucking puppy and shit. Yeah. Everybody. Who kills a puppy? And all this would have done is a puppy with a fucking box of chocolates. And I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Everything would have done to Listen, yeah. we got you a beautiful fucking dog. We're sorry about the dog. Beat the fuck out of my son. He's an asshole anyway. You're doing me a favor. But we brought... Give him the dog. <laughs> Give him the caviar. I Give know. him the vodka. <laughs> Give him an envelope. Yeah. We don't need this war. You're too tough for this. You don't need to come out of retirement. You don't need to fucking hit the floor mm-hmm. with a sledgehammer. Oh, I was just thinking about that, that when he hits when the, the floor, floor with the sledgehammer. It's like, oh, it's this. fucking over for these people. Yeah. Let me uh, read this fucking sponsor and we'll get the fuck out of here. As usual, on it, I love you guys. Sent me a package today, some shroom tech, some tea uh, booster, some alpha brain, the, the new liquid, the new uh, doses. And we hooked my man Lee up with some protein powder. Lee's going to kettlebells three days a week. He's really committed to this thing, so he's going to do a protein shake after his workout to help him. And we're going to talk to you about the the new uh, Mike the, Dolce protein powder. Yeah, it looks really good. Once it's he almond, does, it's it looks- almond banana. It looks fucking beautiful. I haven't smelt it. I didn't want to open up the bag. I don't want you to walk around thinking I Cosby you. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't open up your bag. Somewhere Joe Diaz put it. Somewhere Joey Diaz put his sleeping pill in my protein powder. <laughs> So, no, I didn't want to go in your protein. Just tell me what you think. You know what I'm saying? You may like it. You may, I like the the hemp force protein. But anyway, let's cut the basics. 
Go to Onnit.com. If you see any supplements you like, just read about them. I could sit here for fucking hours and bore you to death. Why fuck around? Go to Onnit and press in the code word CHURCH. Boom! And get 10% off. C-H-U-R-C-H. Onnit.com. Also, I want to welcome a new sponsor. To, let me ask you something, people. Where the fuck do you think we live here? You think we live in Beverly Hills? No. We live in a suburb close to a place called North Hollywood, okay? If you drive around North Hollywood, all you see are massage parlors, mattress stores, weed stores, and tattoo stores. And I'm talking the emphasis on mattress stores. Have you gone shopping for a mattress in North Hollywood? Here? I just bought a mattress in North Hollywood. And was it a pain in the ass? It was a complete pain in the ass. What'd you drop? Uh, it was about five hundred dollars. That's not fucking bad. And is the mattress comfortable? Is it yours? For I don't the boys? give a shit. It was for the boys. <laughs> okay, so fuck it. But for one of the boys, it cost you a nickel a roof for a single bed or a double. It was a full size bed. A full size uh-huh. bed. For the skinny one, what's he need a full size bed for? You gotta put him in a little skinny he fucking bed. He wanted a full size bed. Marine style, you right. know what I'm saying? Like a teepee in there and shit. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to buy my daughter a fucking teepee. You should. Dude, kids love tents. I bought and my teepees. kids a TP. They loved it. I've been telling my wife we gotta go down to the thing. I <laughs> sent her on a simple mission. She came back with a thousand stories about this one's too big, this one's too small. Terry, just buy the fucking tent. How, how difficult is it to buy a tent? Well, how do you know? Because with Diaz's, we love being in holes. We're like Vietnamese people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we love being hidden. When you go in the baby's room at night, there's blankets and teddy bears. The teddy bear Steve Simone gave her, she puts it on top of her head, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, she's like a deer. She covers herself up. You know, you don't know how lucky I am. I have the sleep apnea machine. You come into my room, all you see is a hose. <laughs> come out from under the mattress. That, I'm like, it looks like an armadillo. All you you see, can sleep under the mattress? Under the, the blankets. Oh, no, that's too much. The air goes down to zero, and I put the blankets over my fucking head, and I go to nappy noo time, <laughs> and all you see is a hose. You know how long I've been doing that? When I was a kid, I used to make like a little tunnel around my mouth and shit, and just... Like that. I love all that shit. But I can't breathe when I'm under the blankets. And you have trouble when you can't breathe. That's you? perfect. That's what knocks you out. Eventually you pass. <laughs> <laughs> it's like half suicide. You know what I'm saying? It's like sitting in the garage without the hose. You just sit there with the fumes and you open up a window. You don't die. You just sit there and get dizzy. You <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> I'm a little dizzy. <laughs> Anyway, the point being, you're unique. You don't walk like everybody else. You don't talk like everyone. And you don't sleep like everyone. So why is your mattresses one size fits all? Now, you people think like we fuck around here in the church. I got a guy who calls me up and he sends me shit every week. Felicia, they they, they got people sponsoring shit now that you can't believe. And they send it to me and I look at half this stuff Mm -hmm. and I go, I can't talk about this shit. I can't even mention them. They're so ridiculous, you know. And I try to run them by Lee, and we giggle. Sometimes I send them to my attorney. He just says no. But sometimes <laughs> I go, you know what? I went to buy a fucking mattress, and it was a pain in the ass. It I really know, is. It, it is. really fucking is a pain in the ass. Except for that one place across from Bank of America on Lancashire. They don't fuck around. That dude, and he delivers the next day. He don't fuck around. But again, you got to go in and you don't even finagle him. You just tell him what you want to pay for, and he'll point you to the mattress. Give him three days, he'll pick it up. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Right across. He, right, he wasn't bad. Right. If you go to that place in North Hollywood, then it's a fucking piece of shit. Then you get robbed up there. They hide behind the curtains. You don't know <laughs> if they're there. You go in there. Sometimes they're not there. Anyway, I'm not here to talk shit about anybody. With but when I read about the Helix mattress, I fucking died. I was like, this sounds perfect because I'm married and I know what it's like. I like my bed one way, and Terry likes it the other. So somewhere along the line, we came to terms. But my side's getting a little soft, so I tried to flip it, and she caught me. (laughs) (laughs) She was doing laundry, and I flipped that motherfucker, but she knew something. A pee stain, something. (laughs) She knew. But anyway, you're unique. You don't walk like everybody. You don't talk like everybody. You don't sleep like everybody. So why is your mattress one size fits all? Because a custom mattress will cost you five to 10,000 bucks until now. Introducing the Helix Sleep, where you can buy your mattress online, customized for you for hundreds of dollars instead of thousands. You go to helixsleep.com, you answer a few simple questions based on four key preferences, and the result 
will be a custom sleep profile used to build you the most comfortable mattress you'll ever, ever sleep on. Your mattress will arrive at your door in about a week, and shipping is 100% free on the arm. And for couples, Helix customizes each side of the mattress. So if Paula sleeps over, they can put a better nails on that side. You understand me? And you can sleep on the fucking nice side. They can do whatever you want. No, I'm just kidding. You. No, no, that's me. Because we're going to be moving in together, so we're going to need a new mattress. That's right. So here you go. Yeah. Helix customers report a 30% improvement in overall sleep quality. You have 100 nights to try it out, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you 100% refunds, no questions asked. That's why everyone from GQ to Forbes are all talking about the Helix Sleep. Do me a favor. Go to helixsleep.com slash joey. You get 50% off your order. No, $50. 50. I'm sorry. $50 off your order. That's helixsleep.com slash joey. Helixsleep.com slash joey. And you get $50 off your order. Again, it's a fucking pain in the ass. This is the future, people. Nobody's going to leave their house for dick if they any fucking got a smart a brain in their head. Hey, look at last year. Sales are down over the holidays. Amazon's controlled it. This is it. You're going to be able to fucking buy anything online from now on. Free fucking shipping. You don't have to worry about delivery. They're going to show from 10 to 2. Then the truck broke down in fucking uh, La Hambra. And you got to wait there all fucking day. <laughs> Why is my mattress in fucking La Hambra? I bought it in North Hollywood, cocksucker. Anyway, these days are over. Do me a favor. Go to helixsleep.com right now. Slash Joey and get fifty dollars off your order. All right, that's helixsleep.com slash Joey. That's right, right now helixsleep.com slash Joey. Fifty dollars and you're gonna sleep like a fucking angel every night. All right. I want to thank On It. I want to thank our new sponsor Helix Sleep. I want to thank Felicia stopping by. Do not forget, you're there. What nights? Break it down. I'm there uh, tomorrow uh, till Sunday. Yes, I come old back school, Monday. Old, old school, old school. Tuesday through Sunday. Week. That's a long fucking week. Well, it was nice today talking about Trump and how the FBI could hold him. See, I had to drop knowledge on you motherfuckers. You guys don't know how they do it. It's not called blackmail. It's letting you know. I know what you did, cocksuckers. I ain't going to say nothing to nobody. <laughs> but I, want, I, better my, I better get my funding. I want to get my 300000 You, you want your 30%? 30%. That ain't nothing, Lee. What are you, 100000 Lee? You got problems. You know what I'm saying? You got to see I don't know how much a walkie-talkie is worth. That seems like a little steep, but okay. No, a walkie-talkie... Let's say you put Paul out there. Right. She'll save you some money, but that's a pain in the ass. Now she's going to want 600000 Well, how, how did she get six now? Because she's Paula. She's got the power that you ain't got, a muffler and a monkey, and you can rub it on your face. You understand me? <laughs> so you'll take the short 40% <laughs> for the walkie-talkie, but if you get busted, she'll roll over on you. You follow what I'm saying to you? Because she's not going to take the fall for you out there. She doesn't know about police scanners and shit like that like I know, and I'll find out. I have every fucking police scanner from North Hollywood to Studio City to fucking Hollywood wide. I'll be out there with the scanner working. I make believe I'm listening to an iPod <laughs> doing jumping jack, but I'm paying attention. I got the walkie-talkie like, like fucking uh, uh, whatever. You're doing fine, Lee. <laughs> You're doing fine, Lee. There's a lady walking down here with a dog. You're doing fine. And you're like, I got in, anything, nothing. You got 38 seconds. I'm downstairs, count it down for you. You got 37 seconds, 36. Where wow. is he? He's in the apartment laying down with a broad. Shoot him both. Just shoot him both. The money's right down to the matches. Boom, 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 boom. You shoot him, you come back out. The alarm gets triggered. You get back on to like James Bond. Zzz, right here to the roof. I unbuckle you. We light the fucking thing on fire. What, what what thing is on fire now? The rope. Oh, okay. God knows who they blame it on. You know what I'm saying? We'll dump okay, some. I can see. I, 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 I know right. you earned your money. I got the car parked. <laughs> I got a stolen car already parked. F -f Gas. We're going to go three or four blocks. We're going to go by the 7-Eleven where the lady got stabbed. We're going to park it right there. <laughs> then we're going to walk two or three blocks. <laughs> and we're going <laughs> to fucking, and that's it. We're going to split up the money. We're going to shake hands. <laughs> And I've never seen Lee this high before. <laughs> oh, this is what we do. <laughs> that much, but just this, is, poor lady. <laughs> this is what we do. What happens? That poor lady. Who? <laughs> you got stabbed. Oh, what are you going to do? You got a 7 Eleven. Somebody's going to lose their mind someday. Someday some dude goes in there at one in the morning and they got no fucking Reese's Pieces. Isn't that the one that you think has the ISIS? I know they're ISIS. <laughs> That's why there was a stabbing in there. 
I've known their ISIS for years. I just don't tell nobody. I'm not a rat. I'm not a punk bitch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Felicia Michaels, Reno. I'll be at the Brea Improv all weekend, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Tickets are still available. I love you, motherfuckers. See you Wednesday night. Have a great day. Stay black. Hit it, Lee.